and then it'll mute you because you're a webinar. And then so it's already muted. Yeah, it's muted, right? Not muted. I mute. mute click that. It's that means it's. I want to be muted. It's not. You're not muted. The browser that has the PowerPoints. Yeah.
Technical issues there on my end. Um, are we good on the live stream and the and Zoom? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, welcome to our special board meeting on Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022. Special board meeting of the Santa Clara Unified School District Board of Trustees. I'm calling this meeting to order at 5 10 p.m. We'll start with a roll call. Trustee Canova? Absent. Trustee Fairchild? Here. Trustee Gonzalez? Absent. Trustee Lieberman? Here. Okay, Trustee Ratterman? Here. Trustee Ryan? Absent. Trustee Muirhead, I'm here. Um, Dr. Kemp, can you um, do the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Good evening, everyone. If you please stand, put your hand over the heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is our district mission and vision statements. So the mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. And our vision is that graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future-ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Yeah, I'm looking for a review and acceptance of the agenda. Do we have a Motion to approve or any changes? Move to approve Fairchild. Second, Lieberman. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments about it? Uh, Trustee Ratterman? Yeah, um, I was a little surprised to see, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to see on this agenda that didn't show up. And so I'm not gonna belabor that point too much, but I didn't see, um, I see there's a discussion about the Laurel Wood in private in closed session about the Laurel Wood principal, but I don't see any action item on the agenda. It's there, it's F. 
Oh. Somebody else asked that same question. It's way at the bottom. Was it was it there previously? Yes, I, it's always been there. Well, my apologies then. Um, I'm fine. I did want to see, I actually had wanted to see us have a couple of those items I mentioned last board meeting, so we could have a board discussion about them, not necessarily a thing, but um, we'll discuss that later. Okay. Um, yeah, I was trying to keep the scope of this meeting to what we needed to do, especially the facilities materials. Um, okay, any other comments on this um, agenda? Okay, so we have a motion by Trustee Fairchild and a second from Trustee Lieberman um, to accept the agenda as is. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, so that passes one, two, three. Four. And I did have just one aye. point of information. Uh, is, is this meeting being um, is online? Yes, okay, it's excellent. being live streamed and it's and the Zoom is up. I just wanted to be certain that was the case. Thank you. There it is. Zoom is up. Good. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, we are going to be talking about um, facilities issues, a facilities discussion to begin with. So um, because this is a special meeting, we're only doing public comment on the agendized items, which would be those facilities items. So we'll, we will have an opportunity to um, have public comment on each of those discussion items. Um, but if there is somebody who wishes to speak now um, on those facilities items, we can take that public comment now. Is there any, and if you're on the Zoom, now would be the time to raise your hand if you wanna do your comment now instead of later. And if you're on the live stream, you'll need to join the Zoom in order to do your comment. So is there anyone who wishes to do that comment now? And anyone on the Zoom? So President Muirhead, if I could ask one other question. After we've had the discussion, yes. if somebody in the public has heard something that they want to comment on afterwards, mm -hmm. we'll give them another opportunity. To Absolutely. Well, yeah, I just mentioned that we'll have an opportunity for public comment. Before and each after item. sounds great to me, so I'm, I'm yeah. happy. Thanks. Yep. Because sometimes the presentation makes you think of something to ask. So, okay, then we, I don't see any public comment at this time. So we are going to um, start in with our facilities discussion. Um, I've set aside an hour for the first item and 45 minutes for each of the second and third items. Um, so I've got Trustee Lieberman running a countdown clock and, and she'll give us some updates so that we can make sure we keep moving along and get to all of the items on the agenda tonight. So um, we've got, um, I believe we have Ms. Healy starting us off or trust, uh, Superintendent Kemp, are you starting us off with B.1 discussion of the Bracker, Briarwood and Westwood Elementary Master Plan options. I wanna thank uh, Michelle Healy for being here this evening to provide this update to the board and Mr. Scheel, who is joining us remotely this evening to um, provide backup and answer any questions that the board might have. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening, Board of Trustees. I'm Michelle Healy, Director of Facility Development and Planning. And with me tonight is Maria Madrigal from LPA Architects. And we'll be reviewing the master plan progress that we've made on Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood. This will be similar to the other presentations you've seen, but we'll be focusing on each school individually. And, um, and then we'll get your comments after each school. So we'll go through the map two potential master plans for Bracker, get some feedback from you, two potential master plans for Briarwood, get feedback, and then Westwood. I knew I should have tried this. So I guess we should take public comment after each one as well, then if you're gonna stop for questions on each one, you wanna do that? Probably. Yeah, I think so. I have to hold this down. We all know I have problems with this thing. Sorry, Joe. Well, the next slide is the schedule and the schedule is, uh, oh, I just had to get closer. Okay. The next slide is the schedule. And um, basically we have had two larger community meetings for each school site. And we've gone out to the public. We have met with school staff. We've met with a bunch of different site, local site committees, as well as district office staff on all three of these projects separately as well together. 
And so um, we plan on having one more community meeting either later this year, but most likely in the fall. And then we'll bring back the plans to the board one last time also. The next slide uh, shows the stakeholder engagement. And that basically goes through who we've met with for each of the schools. Um, and we've done this for each school. So Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood. Next slide. I'm gonna let Maria talk about some of the community feedback that we've received and walk you through the master plans. Thanks, Michelle. Good evening, trustees and Superintendent Kemp. I am pleased to be here tonight to go through the three uh, schools and the potential master plan options. Like Michelle said, we will presenting two. Um, to start off, we will uh, have a slide noting some of the feedback that we've received from that various community engagement that Michelle talked about from uh, staff meetings, from community meetings, um, as well as from focus groups with district staff. So to start off with Bracker Elementary School, we heard that the parking is inefficient. Uh, you know, the drop off sometimes even goes all the way to Bowers. Uh, so um, addressing that and addressing the safety of students was important. Um, in order to make the school uh, more of a community asset, make it more vibrant and elicit more pride. Uh, the NPR and administration spaces are too small and student service spaces are lacking or inadequate. Uh, sometimes in spaces that are entirely too small for the function. Uh, removal of the portables on the campus uh, was a big item, as well as addressing the children's center facility at Bracker especially, um, that's in a pretty dilapidated uh, state. Um, outdoor learning was also a big priority uh, with teachers, but also in conversations with uh, district staff and providing more outdoor spaces like gardens uh, that are more um, varied in terms of their function, not just, you know, hard courts and gardens, but having a, a larger variety of spaces. Um, addressing specialty classrooms like STEM, um, art, and music, as well as improving um, hard courts and the play areas and play structures and providing shade. Um, another thing that came up is providing more student restrooms on the campus um, and addressing shortfalls in terms of the sizing of um, staff spaces like administration spaces, workrooms, student lounges, things like that. Um, and also um, providing just more modern and flexible classrooms for uh, Bracker. Uh, next slide, please. All right, there we go. So. Uh, first, we'll start off with option one for Bracker, um, and I know it's probably pretty small on the screen, but um, if an item is in white with a colored outline, it means it's new construction. If it is a solid color, it means it's a building that is existing that will be modernized. And if it is uh, a hatched area on the plan, that means it's an existing building, but it would be reconfigured. So that would be more removing walls, taking away walls versus the modernization, which is the solid square, which would be, you know, replacing finishes and lighting um, in terms of uh, the modernization. So option one, we started with addressing one of the bigger items, um, starting from the top of the school, since I don't have a pointer, hopefully you can follow along, um, addressing the parking situation at Bracker. So extending the parking lot all the way through the property line, um, where it starts now until um, essentially the, the end of the east side of the campus. Uh, starting again with the front of the school, there is a preschool and TK cluster that's located on the east side of the campus that has an adjacent separate parking lot. And then next to that is a new NPR building with uh, aftercare as well as an admin space. So it doesn't necessarily mean this will all be one building. It's just essentially where the programs are located within the campus. Um, in that yellow area, uh, kind of in the top middle is a new entry court adjacent to the administration building. And then adjacent to that is 
uh, the kindergarten area. So that is the existing kindergarten area just reconfigured to allow for more classrooms. So both the Bracker plans that we will present tonight allow for uh, four cohorts, so four classrooms per grade. Moving down the left side of the plan, so there are um, the existing finger wings that will be completely modernized with uh, space in between converted to outdoor garden, outdoor learning space with shade. Um, and then the orange block that you see within those classrooms is the wellness center. So that would be all the spaces um, like psychology, counseling, um, all the student services space be lo centrally located within one space with breakout space for students as well. Um, if we move down to the south of the plan, there is a new two-story classroom building. So it adds an additional eight classrooms as well as a STEM uh, maker space, a music classroom, and then a new library since the wellness center that we're proposing is actually where the existing library is. So that opens up into a grove of trees, so creating a nature grove in that area. Um, just to the left of that is a uh, new staff parking. Currently it is used for the preschool parking, but keeping uh, students away from that parking lot since it's next to Bowers, um, we thought it was a better use to keep it a staff parking lot. Um, and then obviously with the reconfiguration of everything that's happening, um, reconfiguring the field as well as the hard courts. Next slide. So option two is a very similar to option one with a couple of key differences. Um, so instead of having the library be at the south end of the campus with the new construction of the two-story classroom building, it's actually located adjacent to the NPR at the front of the school. Um, and then the admin building is actually located roughly where it um, is located now. Um, so this option is just slightly different and we actually had conversations um, during the community meetings about the pros and cons of these options. Um, in terms of the feedback we received on both of the options, um, the community liked the outdoor space that was between the classrooms. Um, they thought the parking lot um, layout was improved um, and the placement of the buildings made sense relative to the campus. Um, but there was discussion about the location of the library um, whether centrally located would be um, preferred or in front of the school or kind of on the periphery where it's a little bit quieter. Um, one comment we did receive is that the music does make more sense to be located next to the NPR, um, not uh, next to the STEM and library um, like it was previously uh, noted. Um, and then to also consider the frontage on Bowers Avenue and to beautify that as well. Um, so at this point, I think we'll pause for comment or questions. Okay, so we'll start with Trustee Fairchild. Thank you so much. Um, it's exciting to see the potential changes. Can um, Ms. Healy, can you identify which, if any of these projects are currently funded? So what is funded for Bracker and on the list? Um, is they will be getting, and this is actually for um, all three of the schools, we are planning on some quick start projects and they'll be getting those next summer. So they might be some stage structures, security fencing and gating, as well as playgrounds. And then for Bracker specifically, what was mentioned in the bond language is a new administration as well as a multi-purpose and new um, child development portable or facilities for um, the children's centers and some type of modernization. Um, it included like some windows and roofing and those types of options. Um, there's also some other smaller miscellaneous projects in there, but those would be the bigger projects. And with Bracker, one of the things that we've been talking about with these master plans and all the, the master plans is that we're creating this for the whole site. And so phase one will be funded, but the rest of the phases are not funded at this time, and that will be district wide. So um, we're going back to Bracker, um, and actually we've been doing it at the community meeting, um, and we asked them what their top priority was. So 
what is your top priority? Is it potentially a new classroom building instead of the multi? Or is it the multi and the admin and the library? So the bond language does give us a little bit of flexibility on that. And so we're going back to each of the school sites and making sure that that priority is what we're working on over the next couple of years. And um, Trustee Fairchild, before you um, continue, there were some board member questions and in that um, response, and did this get this response, did it just come to me or did everyone get it? Everyone got it, okay. And it's also posted, is it um, on the agenda online so people can see it? Yeah, that we got a hard copy, right. Is it also on the agenda? I don't think Jean has posted it yet. Um, yeah, it came after we posted the agenda, but we can certainly put them up there for the community to see. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, but it does list the projects um, in that document, just FYI. Okay, Thank you. continue. Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, my next question would be, um, when you were coming up with the scenarios of four classrooms per grade, did you do an enrollment study along with that? And do we have that data? Yes, so um, that enrollment data was is when we do our yearly enrollment projections and Bracker is an interesting school because it's getting a lot more students. Um, and so we did um, look at that and take that into consideration. So we do those every year and the data that we used for this one was um, basically based on a 600 student school and um, what we think that those enrollment projections will be. Okay, thank you so much. And then my last question right now is regarding the special education classrooms. There's currently three on that site. And are they in this plan? And are we getting them the facilities they need? We um, did leave them off of this plan. And the school site was very um, conscious of pointing that out to us. And so we didn't, we wanted to show you what we showed the community. Um, but we have kind of moved things around. Um, we'll most likely be adding classrooms either around the multi or in that two-story classroom building to make up for those. Okay, that makes me happy because one of the things I've seen over and over and over again, if you go throughout our schools that are, as our special ed classrooms end up in portables. And so I would like us to be thoughtful in including them in design so that they are not exiled to the portables on all the schools. Yeah, we have had um, several meetings with Ms. Alanis and her staff and um, the special ed teachers at, at the schools, and we'll continue to talk with them and get their feedback as to what they want in those classrooms. And that's one of the things that we'll be developing um, over the summer is what exactly that special ed experience should look like on each of our schools. And, and this thought just came to me as, as we I reflect on all of the feedback we've gotten from the various special ed education teachers this year. Um, some of the trigger points have been access to bathroom facilities, access to changing facilities that are close, that are age appropriate for their students. And so just putting it out there, you'll probably hear the same comment for everyone. Thanks. Okay, Trustee Ratterman. By the way, my compliments. Thank you for a lot of work. I actually had the luxury of being able to sit in on a couple of your sessions. And really appreciated the outreach and, and the work you're doing. We have a couple of quick questions between option one and two. Um, and, and, and in general, I, on, in general, I did like, you mentioned it verbally, the idea of putting the library somewhere more centrally located. I do like that idea. And, you know, I don't, Mavic, I was a little curious. There is a red cross hash section in what looks like the third from the top of the classroom row. And I think I see CWR, but I'm not sure. What is that? That would be an extra workroom um, slash lounge for the teachers. Okay, so it's nothing critical. No. Um, and, and that well, actually- Well, it's critical, it's for the well, teachers. Well, no, 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 don't get me wrong. <laughs> Let me let me rephrase that before you I get quoted in somebody's back paper. Yeah, you need you need to. It is the that. it is location is not critical to that particular building. So we parse our words. Um, but Some people I might do think uh, that that building where that's located might be a good option for the library. And um, the library currently is located on the bottom of the area, and that could actually be reconfigured with more classrooms to make up for what was lost. I did have a question. It's probably just the fact that this hasn't been well developed 
uh, detailed, detailed. I'm just speaking on a right and left basis here, detailed. Um, I didn't see how they're getting to the second story. I guess that's just because you didn't. It's because it's too small. Um, so if you squint. They, um, they jump really hard. I've been squinting. <laughs> down, <laughs> down below the classrooms, there is a, a wing of it's the custodial, the restrooms, the elevators, the everything else. And then we would look at having some type of um, outdoor stairway also. So that's down on the lower west side. And um, this site actually came up with a really great idea when we were talking to the staff, uh, I think it was just last week, they actually requested that their staff lounge be placed on the opposite side near Bowers because they already go out and sit on that lawn and eat lunch. And so um, they had thought that it would be really nice to have an outdoor eating area in that location. So um, we've already been kind of moving things around for that. And they thought that the library could be in that location or also up where in the yellow shaded where the, it shows the wellness center. Yeah, and, and to me, that would be, I would, my desires aren't terribly important here. I think the site level, what they think would be best for them would be where I would want to go. You let it run while she talks. So I'm going to continue. I have one, one more primary question. When we look at the NPR building on both of them, on the back of one, it shows aftercare. On the other one, it has a bunch of letters that I can't quite figure out. Um, actually, I probably could if I squint. Um, got some KTTTs. And one of the discussion points during the meetings was the possibility of having a pass-through uh, NPR similar to what exists on Caligen, where the internal uh, stage space can also be reversed to go to the external, either the internal or out or external. But it would, the logical place to do it would be where the aftercare and the TTK, whatever that is, uh, is located. So is, is, did you have some thoughts about that or is there a, a plan? Uh, we're still working that out. So one of the options is to kind of, if we kind of splay it a little bit more and move the library down into a more central location, then we have more access for that, the shade structure to be able to eat outside and then um, have a, an amphitheater type um, that we are thinking about and planning at the rest of the school. So this school, we're just still figuring still out where exactly that. that should go. Um, and the little TTTs are all toilets. So um, we are, we are, we so are you looking can, you to can sit out there and everywhere. watch the show. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, see how much trouble I can get in with that one. Um, but at any rate, thank you very much. It, it, nice job. And I'm, gl I'm glad to see there's still some things that are being worked through and we'll be excited to hear what you have to come up with. Thank you. So um, you said the T's are toilets. What's the K in that same building? So it would be a portion of the kitchen um, but also after school. So it's, it's a large kitchen and after school and lots of other items. Okay. The, um, the only other thing I was, th I was thinking about, yeah, go ahead. When I um, look at these different choices is um, because I really respect the, the teachers and the staff coming up with classrooms and all that thing. Um, I'm also thinking from a community standpoint of which buildings the community might want access to and making sure that those are accessible. So for instance, in option two, you have both the NPR and the library near the um, parking. And those, I believe, and, and you'd have to ask the school staff, but I believe those are the two areas that really would get some like community kind of functions in there, especially the NPR, of course. Um, and so um, I think about the importance of keeping those uh, easily accessible so they don't have to like be walking all the way through the school to find the NPR. Um, but that, depending on, on how the school feels, that might be the case for the library as well. And I don't know if there are other spaces. Um, I think it's important to keep the TK and preschool nearer the parking, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but I'm also thinking about what the community um, would use. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, so currently we don't let our community use our libraries. Um, we consider them kind of a sacred space for the school. We don't want books to go missing. We don't want there to be food spilled in there. And so we usually don't rent that out. Um, mm -hmm. The school itself might have meetings in there, but we don't usually let the community in. And so most of the schools are okay having that library not near the parking lot, but okay. the multi-purpose, absolutely. Um, we're, we're talking about making them slightly larger so that they can hold more people in them. Mm -hmm. um, and then also we've been kind of playing around with some different ideas of potentially making aftercare, maybe 
a larger room that could be also used for PE and then there could be other meetings in there too. So we still have some ideas that we're just bouncing around and um, I think throughout the vision 2035 process we'll come to more conclusions about some of those but um, especially with Bracker, um, the community is such an integral part of that school. Mm -hmm. And we have done a lot of outreach there. We talked to lots of people during open house last week and um, they've been really supportive of this. And so we've gotten lots of feedback from them. Good. And um, uh, the um, enrollment, you said the enrollment is growing, but do you know offhand what their current enrollment is? and and any ideas about thoughts of where that might get to over the next few years? So currently they are um, just under 300, they're under 300. Um, all of the new residential development that is north of Pfeiffer, above a uh, north of Costco in the um, mm -hmm. Lawrence Stationery Plan, though, all those students are gonna go to, um, to Bracker. And so um, there's a big mix of units there. Um, there's gonna be a lot of units. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of affordable housing, which we're not really seeing in some of the other areas. There's going to be affordable townhomes, some affordable single family homes. Um, it's really one of the only places that they're building single family detached um, homes in the city. And so um, we know that there'll be families. We're looking at growing um, the majority of those residential units will be completed within the next five to 10 years. And so we're looking at um, doing some right now. We have 13 students coming out of that area and more units are finishing up every day. So I anticipate us having more coming out of there um, next year and throughout the next few years. Yeah, there's a lot of growth there. So yeah. um, it does make sense that that is a school that's growing, whereas others are shrinking, just like the county is shrinking in the, and uh, such. So one of our only schools that's growing. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, other questions? Uh, Trustee Gonzalez. So my thoughts were uh, in line with uh, Trustee Muirhead and thank you for the report. I think it's uh, really uh, thorough. As far as the libraries and, and uh, well, I guess we're not using, but even if they do use it for their, their community, their their parents, I think it's, it's nice for them to have uh, access. So I think too, it makes it easier for the parents to get to it. Obviously, the parking lot, I mean, it's going to make a, a world of difference for them to uh, be able to get in and out a lot easier. And um, the wellness center, I, I think, and I think that you mentioned um, in the previous conversations was that with the wellness centers, I think that it, it's important for not only our Title I schools, but, you know, Bracker and West and uh, Scott Lane to have something that we, whether they become wellness centers or not, that, that, that we have that thought in mind as far as, uh, Making sure that we can uh, try to accommodate it, especially as we uh, try to meet the needs of, of our students and understand that, you know, talking about the whole child means more than just uh, education. When it comes to education, so I think that's important. Um, so yeah, I think uh, if, if if it was just uh, my choice, I would probably look at more towards option two as being the preferred option. But um, definitely, uh, I like what what's been done and. Uh, it's a matter of finding a, the nickel to make it happen. All right, thank you. Are there any public comments on Bracker? <laughs> <laughs> so I see we're behind time. Oh, okay. Um, so do we have any slips? None for Bracker. None for Bracker. Um, so I'm looking out at the Zoom. Uh, let me look out at the Zoom. There's no public comment because now would be the time to raise your hand if you're out on the Zoom. Okay, and um, Dr. Kemp, we don't seem to have the link for written public comments. Can you make sure that that's being handled? Thank you. Um, okay, then if that is it for Bracker, we will move on to the next one. So next is Briarwood. So some of the feedback that we heard during the initial visioning sessions for Briarwood are actually a lot of similarities with some of the issues at Bracker. Um, the parking and drop-off has a pinch point at the entry um, that affects the circulation and the drop-off um, lane is um, very short. 
Um, they requested more shade on the campus, um, making the front of the campus more vibrant. There's a beautiful lawn, but it's not really used um, by the school. Um, that area is essentially underutilized and um, could be better used. Um, the administration building is located well, we heard, but it's too small and poorly laid out. Uh, the NPR should function better and have a permanent stage. Right now, they have a portable stage. A removal of the portables from the campus, um, similar to Bracker, outdoor learning spaces and gardens was requested, um, and uh, flexible specialty classrooms like STEM, music, and art. Um, and then providing just more shade for different functions in the hard courts and play areas. So we'll start with option one for Briarwood. So this option will start again at the front of the school. So essentially taking that lawn area in front of the administration building and using it to build a longer drop-off lane so that uh, parents and students could enter through the existing um, parking lot entry, but actually exit uh, further down uh, the street to kind of stop that congestion that's happening and also provide some parking at the front of the school for drop-off for um, early childhood grades. Um, so at the south end of the campus where the existing kindergarten uh, two classrooms are, that is proposed to be converted to preschool classrooms. And then the two adjacent buildings um, converted to uh, kindergarten and to TK so that there's an early childhood cluster on the campus. Uh, between the two buildings would be an early childhood garden. Um, the area just south of the preschool classrooms will still remain a play area for the preschool and then building uh, an adjacent play area just south of the kindergarten building um, for the kindergarten kids. Um, in terms of the NPR, the NPR would remain, it would just be modernized with a permanent stage added and the kitchen would be demolished to uh, meet the standards of the current kitchens that St. Clair Unified is building for elementary schools. In terms of the existing buildings, so um, all of the finger wings remain uh, some of them are reconfigured. So you could see to the left of the library, which is the purple building, there is the reconfigured wellness center, um, similar program to the one um, at Bracker. And then the rest of the classrooms um, get modernized or reconfigured. Um, and then there's a STEM and a music classroom um, just to the left of the NPR building. On the north end of the campus are two aftercare buildings with an outdoor area and with shade. Um, and then with everything, reconfiguration of the fields, um, added shade structures, and then uh, hard courts and play yards. Next slide. So option two for Briarwood uh, does have a couple of key differences here. So um, one of the main differences is that the existing NPR building would actually be converted to a library space. You could see the big uh, purple building uh, right at the front of the school. And then a new NPR with a new kitchen and shade would be built um, at the north end of the campus adjacent to a new access road that would essentially divide the Little League fields uh, from the campus. Um, essentially, everything else remains the same. There are a couple of differences in terms of where classrooms are located. Uh, for example, in this option, the STEM and music and art are located in the northernmost wing so that they are adjacent to the outdoor space and to the NPR space. And then there are a couple of flex spaces that are created by moving the library to the NPR. Um, in this option, we are providing an auxiliary um, kitchen prep space for the kindergarten wing, just because the NPR is located uh, essentially the opposite um, end of the campus as the early childhood grades. Um, and there's just a slight reconfiguration of the way the fields and the hard courts um, have laid out. Um, some of the feedback we received on these plans, um, they, uh, the school staff and the community like the smaller garden and the outdoor space between the classrooms as opposed to um, one garden that's located at the corner of the campus that's not as accessible. Um, they thought the parking layout was improved. Um, they did express a desire to have separate um, upper and lower play areas. So that's something that we actually, in the newest iterations, we've addressed. Um, 
and then a request for a shaded uh, PE space. Um, regarding the access road, we received um, mixed comments. Um, folks liked the separation, uh, the kind of separation between the um, little league fields and the campus, but some were concerned about um, access and safety um, with that access road. At this point, we'll pause again for comments. Okay. Uh, Trustee Fairchild, you can start. Thank you so much. Um, this is my neighborhood. That's the park that I go to um, on the other side of those fields. And one of the things I will say that is most confusing for the community is knowing where the school ends and where the park starts. I would say most people think that those baseball fields are part of the park. And I have also had to let people know that, that the lawn area behind the school was not for their dogs during the day. So I, I don't know if an access road is the answer, but my concern is still the security of that, the perimeter of that school. And so my question is, where are we with the security of, and the perimeter? So we have a fencing plan that LPA is working on right now. And um, that will be going to DSA as soon as they're done with it. And then we'll be installing it. And this is for all three schools, uh, Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood. And so we'll most likely be installing the fencing um, in the fall. But the fence line is going to be, um, basically, we're going to be fencing the backside. Here. Oh, well, look. So we, I know. Yeah. So um, I found one. Um, so we're going to be fencing off. And right now, a lot of the neighborhood comes in this way. Yes. Um, and they go north to the park and then they come south onto the campus. So we'll be fencing off a pathway for the neighborhood to still get through that way and go north to the park. Right. And then there'll be a gate and then that gate will be locked during the school day, but students can come in that way in the morning to get onto campus. And then we're gonna be fencing on the north side of the baseball fields. Um, connecting up those perimeter fences. And I've worked this out um, with the Little League. And so we'll be fencing up here and then um, just north of where the two fields, the major and minor field come together. And then on this side, we'll be fencing it on the south side, just yeah. next to the parking lot where the batting cages are. And so that fencing will help um, secure that area. One of the um, items so that we're still discussing with the staff and um, they keep they're still not sure whether they want fencing in the absolute front of the school. So we will be fencing. Oh, oh not what I wanted to. Um, so we will be fencing off these areas in here, um, but the consensus seems to be for now to not fence this area right here in front of, which is their current parking lot. Um, it's a long, overhang that's shaded and there's some mixed reviews. So we're talking about maybe just a four foot fence, maybe no fence. Um, no one on the staff feels very strongly that they need a fence right there um, because a lot, their, their biggest concern is people coming in from the behind the school and then from the right. park. And so we absolutely are fencing that. Um, and so we're still going back to them. They still have plenty of opportunity to let us know if they want a fence there. And we've been talking about maybe just putting in a lower fence um, just so they can see what it looks like. And it would be a uh, black vinyl coated chain link so they could kind of feel it out, get used to it. But one of the first phases is to redo the parking lot. And so we could test something out and then we can put something in that's more official when we do the parking lot, which would be one of the first projects. Thank you. Um, just to let you know, and I think the city scrapped it, but there was a dog park um, planned for where you're, they might have scrapped it, but just, just FYI, the community loves dogs over there. The, my next question is, what is the current about enrollment of the school? Because I realize it's one of our smallest ones, and how many um, classes per grade are we planning? At Briarwood, we're planning two classes per grade. And what's the current enrollment about? They are currently somewhere around 250, I believe. And um, as far as the planning as well, uh, they do also have some SAI programs there. Um, and they've come and gone in the 20 years I've been in this district, but are there, is there planning for that as well? 
There would be, yes. So that's one of the items that um, Ms. Olanese and I have been discussing as to which schools may potentially have um, mild mod, mod severe, and how many classrooms that would be, whether it would be three um, and you have you know, TKK one or one, two, three or three, five and, and how those combinations would work. So that's something that we are still discussing. Um, and hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll have a little bit better idea on those. But um, we are certainly are including them um, in our plans. Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is great. I, I would, my only thing is that since I know the community is so used to not respecting the school, they're, they're not intentional, but getting going on the school property, it might be nice to give a heads up through next door when we do the fencing. So there was FYI, we're going to be doing fencing or, or other media, social media platforms so that they know, and here's where you, here's where you can walk. And it's, isn't that great? We've made a walkway for you because <laughs> um, the, I, I see it all the time and, and people, it's not intentional. They just don't know where the boundary is. Um, I, I had a question about this fencing. So uh, you talked about not putting a fence at the front there between the parking lot and those, um, I think those, well, they're currently upper grade classrooms, but do we have any other school? Like we've had issues where we've decided not to put fencing and then something's happened and then we've put in fencing. So do we have any other schools that currently have a big section like this that is without fencing? We do not, which is why there's, we're still having those ongoing conversations with them. Um, but we've, we have some people who really love that open access. And, um, and so we're listening to them, but we're also mentioning that maybe we'll put in a shorter fence and see how it goes. Yeah, okay. I, I, I just have concerns because as soon as you leave an opening, mm -hmm. somebody will find that opening. So, um, okay. Um, any other questions, uh, Trustee Ratterman? Yeah. Um... The gardens are interesting to me. By the way, it's off topic, but uh, Peter Off put in some phenomenal little gardens in those spaces and you know, did a really good job, uh, director of maintenance and stuff. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was a little concerned about uh, the one with the road. I think that's probably uh, the road through. And I did have a question. If you're going to put the road, are you going to connect the road? And it's going to be accessible from Nobili. I think it's Nobili is the east or the west, or the road, the west. Um, but, and I was also curious about putting the NPR in the back like that, what, the, what was driving that decision? Um, and I suspect it was space and being able to build a larger NPR, but I thought maybe you could share with us what you're thinking. Sure. So, um, you know, this site's really interesting. Um, since it is a small school, their existing multipurpose is big enough for them. Um, but there was some community members and staff who thought that a bigger NPR would be better. And they, we talked about different locations to put it, but they didn't want it to be in the middle of the hard courts so that it would block views for recess on one side and the other. And um, they, didn't, they didn't necessarily, um, they, they really liked it on the, that north end, which um, they thought that they could, see everything, it would give them access to, um, they could have the amphitheater coming off the back of it. Um, it could have a large, a few larger shade structures up there and the noise and everything else would be a little bit away from the rest of the school. And um, it's, this conversation has been interesting because I would say it's almost kind of a 50-50, some could go either way, whether we keep the existing one, they do like it being in the middle of the center of the school, but um, to have that bigger kitchen and to have the other amenities, we would need to put it somewhere. And so that need to have more of a continuous space of field and um, hard court kind of overruled and it ended up nestling up in that location. Did drive the decision for the, the, the road splitting the field? What a little bit, yeah. So we were thinking about having, if we needed an emergency exit, if um, nutrition services needed more deliveries coming back to that location, we have discussed that most likely it would be uh, gated off during the school day and that it would just be used 
potentially for deliveries or after school for an extra exit if parents needed to get out that way. Did we, did we um, do any outreach to uh, mm -hmm. Santa Clara Fire just to see if they had any thoughts? Because you know, one of the you you mentioned and you've thought about it, uh, emergency access, et cetera. We haven't specifically reached out to them, but uh, we have been in contact with the City of Santa Clara Public Works. And um, they, of course, like the idea of having an exit there, um, but it's not a make or break yeah. anything for us. And, and we would have to go through some other um, easements and it would we would have to develop that property since that property is city property. Um, it used to be a, a street. So um, there would be some extra complications of having an actual driveway exit going out of there, but it is possible. When you say that property, you're referring to the part between the field and Nobili. Correct. Uh, not the not the field this, itself. Actually, this property. That last little step. Okay. Yeah. To get access. Okay. Well, I will tell you that from my perspective, um, I I get the idea behind that street. Um, I'll call it a street road and whatever. But I think that splitting the field is a negative. I think that uh, probably going to be a lot of cost and expense with very little true benefit coming back. I think it's not going to get used hardly at all. Um, and may create more problems than it's worth. So that's that sort of primary one that I had there. Um, and then the only other thing, and you've already talked about it, is the is your interface with the city and with um, I guess it would be uh, the, the Little League and Pal um, Westside and the other one or Briarwood Little League, I guess it is. And they're pretty much okay with your fencing arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I'm gathering then that means we're going to provide the parking because we're isolating the fields from the north. Yeah, so they would have um, gates to that key. The they would have keys to that gate, and um, basically, when on the weekends, that gate would be open anyway because we leave our gates open on the weekends. So those gates would be open, so the little league would be able to park there, and that would lessen the impact on the streets around the park. Thank you. Um, one last question. The the access. Sorry, you had a question. Okay, just a sec. The access from Nobili to the field. Who owns that land? The city. The city owns it. It's yeah, not our it's, land. It's public. A public right of way. Uh, it's there's a street that dead ends into there, and it was supposed to go all the way through, and it didn't. Okay, great. Um, Trustee Gonzalez, and um, and then we're gonna um go out for public comment and then move on. Yeah. So as far as access, I would say the the option uh, NPR and the front option one would be might be more beneficial but as far as that lane if it does if we do have access all the way to nobly um that might be a possibility that would that would make sense otherwise if it's if it's just gonna i mean if it's not gonna go all the way to nobly i don't see why we should even have that access road back there it would make no uh, no sense to me but um yeah just for access i would say option one is my might would be my preferred option Okay, um, there's nobody in the room who has, anyone in the room who wants to comment on Briarwood? Is there anyone on Zoom? Now would be the time to raise your hand if you're on the Zoom. Nope. Okay, then we are moving on to Westwood. And just so everybody knows, um, at least the attendance numbers from October, um, Bracker had 248 students and Briarwood had 268. And I do know that both of those have decreased since then. Um, and I'll find my spreadsheet with the current enrollment numbers. Can you just repeat those numbers to what? Uh, in October, um, Briarwood had 268. And Bracker had 248. All right, moving on to Westwood. Uh, so for Westwood, um, after the initial visioning sessions, we heard that the parking and drop-off also has issues, issues, especially with the adjacency uh, to Saratoga Avenue. Um, there was a desire to update the school aesthetics. The students are more proud of their school. Um, the campus is full of really mature, beautiful grown trees, but not where students can uh, play or utilize the shade. Uh, for example, there's portables installed um, under some of the bigger canopies. 
um, to improve the wayfinding and flow that the NPR and admin are not properly located and the admin is hard to find. Um, administration and student support spaces are small or lacking um, and also desire to remove uh, portables from the campus. Um, similar to uh, Bracker and Briarwood, the desire for outdoor learning space and gardens and flexible specialty classrooms like STEM, art, and music, um, and a larger NPR that functions better um, and can be used for uh, many events and uses with a kitchen that's properly sized. Um, and then just properly designed uh, hard courts and fields right now. Um, there's hard courts kind of within the field area, uh, so providing a, a more functional design there. Next slide. So option one for Westwood and both options that we'll be presenting accommodate um, three classes per grade. So that's about 400 students. Uh, so we'll start at the front of the school like we did for the other schools. So um, for this campus, uh, essentially what we proposed was actually extend the parking and drop off to basically where the NPR is currently located, um, right at the entrance there at Saratoga Avenue to provide more queuing um, and actually take it through the bus drop off lane um, so that parents wouldn't be queuing on Saratoga Avenue. Um, and then essentially where the existing drop off is, converting that into staff and early childhood parking um, so that uh, parents that are dropping off their um, kindergarten children have a place to park there adjacent to that area. Um, I'll start with the front of the school at that yellow block, which is the entry plaza. So creating a more prominent entry with a new administration building uh, right at the entry there. Um, and then reconfiguring uh, some of the existing uh, kinder classrooms to preschool and TK, and then building a whole new uh, kindergarten wing and preschool TK wing with a co-lab space. Um, converting that area that I was uh, talking about earlier that um, has portables installed under the trees to a shaded kinder play area. And then adjacent to that on the right, uh, the NPR with the stage and the kitchen, which actually has access from um, an access road um, from Bohannon. The existing classrooms um, in this option, the two middle wings would remain. Um, two of the wings would be converted to classrooms with one of them having the wellness center in the orange block. Um, and then in this option, we do have a proposed uh, two-story classroom building that would add um, about nine classrooms and aftercare buildings or aftercare classrooms. And then what that really does is open up the, the ground floor space so that there's actually more play area. So providing more of an outdoor learning with shade just south of that building. Um, this is still something that we're working on in terms of how the two-story building will lay out, um, but there's also a need for the library and the STEM music and art that's kind of located um, in the Northern corner. The idea was that that would be adjacent to the mature grove of trees. So it could be used as a nature walk area, but we're still kind of massaging that area and how it would lay out. Um, with that, the reconfiguration of the fields and also um, the hard court areas. And then option two is um, similar, but it does have some key differences. So in this option, the NPR is more centrally located to the campus, um, right in the middle of the campus there uh, with a kitchen, with an adjacent uh, music room, a stage, um, and that outdoor stage um, just to the right of the NPR. Um, the admin still remains at the front of the school. It's just a little bit um, different orientation. It still has that um, entry plaza. Um, there's also a slight reconfiguration of the preschool and the kindergarten cluster, providing a separate TK um, and preschool area, and then a separate uh, kinder play area. Um, in this option, the library and the STEM are new construction on the south end of the site. So essentially this is building a kind of a new U-shaped building on the south end of the campus. Um, in this option, the three northern wings will remain and just those just get modernized or reconfigured um, to meet the needs of the, the classrooms. Um, the field just has a slightly different uh, configuration and then the hard courts, there's a little bit more hard court 
um, area in this option. Um, some of the feedback that we received about these options, um, most preferred the centrally located NPR location. Um, they did um, like the two story option because it did free up that ground space um, and they liked the the stem near the nature grove as well. Um, there is desire to have separate play areas for the upper and lower grades, which is something that we're addressing in the forthcoming plans and then desire to have um, shaded PE space. Um, one comment about the parking, just to make sure that um, visitors have designated parking as well. Um, and then one suggestion was actually to combine option one and two um, and demolish the two northern buildings and build that two story classroom building there as well. Um, and then the last uh, point was that it's important to maintain the access point for walkers and bikers to the campus to provide that access. At this point, we'll pause again for questions and comments. Hey, Trustee Fairchild. Uh, thank you. What's the enrollment for Westwood? And then um, one of the concerns I have right now is all of your um, parking lot improvements are dependent on funding that we don't have. So the parking lot was part of the phase one projects. Right, but you're moving. Can you show me uh, the current? My thing is, is if I'm looking at this correctly, you're moving in both of those, the multi-purpose room, which is not currently a funded project, right? Multi is. The multi is. Okay, so that answers my question because I was kind of trying to figure out why if we... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Whew, I can breathe. Now, um, as far as the uh, preschool special ed program, is that going to stay on this site? I just didn't hear anything about that. So one of the things that I know um, Ms. Alaniz has been talking about and presenting to you is that we're trying to distribute the special ed throughout the district. And she's been working on that already at Westwood. And every year she has a plan to move another a class off of it so that it can be dispersed throughout the district. So um, we are not planning on having that large amount of special ed classrooms and portables that now divide the, um, the campus in two. And I think everyone's excited that those portables will be going away because those programs will be dispersed. And we are still anticipating some special education classes here. And um, we know that there's also um, the preschool behavior team here, and there's also some other options. And so we'll be working through that as to if they're going to stay at Westwood, then we need to plan for them if they're going to go someplace else. So those are questions that we're still asking. Um, is it okay? Um, Trustee Radman. Thank, again, thank you. By the way, there was one comment, one individual sent me a copy of a option three. I, he did his own, own yeah. graphs, everything, um, and had a lot of very, very good comments in there. Um, you know, it's a single opinion, so it should be incorporated into the rest. But I think that would be something that might be worth sharing because I, I, the, the person put quite a bit of effort into it and, and I, I really respect that. I forwarded it to the architect this morning. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, the other thing is, I had a little question about, uh, well, let's do the NPR room, so in case I run out of time, I really dislike the NPR room in the, um, in the south uh, east corner, I think it creates a security issue. Um, when putting in the center, you've got that primary access coming from administration straight back. So if you have an event where you're having uh, people on campus other than that aren't kindergartners, um, it keeps them away from the kindergarten kindergarten play area. Um, I do want to make sure that we preserve the access from uh, Bohannon, and actually, I think one of your things up there has it wrong. It should be Cyprus, not Bohannon. Cyprus comes in from the west in Bohannon, they intersect. But street names are not terribly important. But there was one where you made the comment, and I couldn't quite follow it, where you said, oh, we would have, um, I thought you said car access from, from that area. And I don't know how you do that without taking out a, a house. It actually already has car access. Uh, that is our emergency fire lane um, that coming between the two homes. Really? Yeah. So it is um, just under 20 feet, but it is what the utilities use um, to get in there to 
um, for electrical as well as gas and then the fire department. So I think we would be better off maintaining that as a pedestrian way and not a vehicular except for emergency access. Um, one thing I think those two neighbors would be quite irritated. But even beyond that, currently, that is sort of the access from the kindergartners and putting vehicles in there also just doesn't feel like a good mix to me. Um, and I'm pretty much out of time, so I think I'll just stop. Okay, uh, Trustee Gonzalez. So for accessibility reasons, I would say the option to probably the, in line with Trustee Raderman's comments as far as the NPR and, uh, and that. The, uh, the other thing, uh, option one though has the uh the two-story building which does free up some space for us that you know i think uh we're not going to get any more land that you know so more space we can free up by doing two-story wings uh that we, we've learned in other places that is beneficial to us for for our students to have more access more blacktops or more green space so i think that that aspect of it i think is so option one is uh something that maybe we can incorporate here um but besides that i think uh be beneficial I, I know that they have the uh the bus drop off so hopefully uh you know this we can incorporate everything as you mentioned as far as the pickup and drop off i think is is important and uh um we can always improve things uh as far as that's concerned obviously two times the other day it's our schools are really impacted with traffic and mm -hmm. The more we can help our, our communities around our locations with that would be uh, beneficial. So I guess those, uh, even though I like option two, that, that aspect of option one, uh, the multi-story is, uh, is interesting and could be beneficial, I think, for, for freeing up space. Okay, and, and I, um, I also, I like how the two-story um, building gives you that more space. Um, in option one, and I also like the library and the and the STEM music art wing being near all those trees. I think that gives you a lot of opportunities there. Um, so, but I'm not crazy about the NPR being way down in that corner. So, um, so maybe some combination of those two options um, might be um, might look good. And um, is does this uh, the fencing plan for this one just cut right across the um, front the whole the Saratoga um, no so the fencing plan for this site we are going to be fencing in between buildings um, so there won't be a fence in front of the multi-purpose the existing multi-purpose that's there so when we're putting in fencing um, it'll be in between the multi-purpose and the next classroom building um, and so well it'll be out a little bit but um so the multipurpose is right here right now. And so we'll be fencing down this way. And then we'll be fencing here along the existing parking lot. Um, one thing that they didn't want is fencing to fence off that multi. We really try, we're trying to use buildings as borders as much as possible. And so they didn't want their campus to look like it was completely fenced in. And so we worked a lot with um, the principal to figure out exactly where that fencing should go. Okay, so and then, then we'll be fencing um, all the way down here and putting in higher fencing all the way down to there's a trash enclosure here and then we'll be and that will all be um, six foot fencing and then it'll actually come back here um, and make a larger aftercare area um, in this area so that that's all six foot fenced so the kids are actually safer out there. Um, and then we'll be replacing the fencing around the entire campus. So all of the perimeter fencing um, along the residential neighborhoods will also get replaced at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the neighbors have been warned that their gates that go directly to the field will be covered and that we're now fencing it off. Um, and there is another- People had fences from their backyards onto the field? Yes, yeah. many gates. Just, just making that clear. Many gates, yes. Um, Almost all the schools have those, so we'll be um, fencing those, and and we've already started that those discussions with the neighbors. Okay, thank you. We um, that quack was uh, we were out of time on this item, so I'm just going to go out to the public. Do we have any public comment? 
Um, and do we have any? I have any slips turned? No, and nothing on the Zoom. Okay, then um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Rena, for coming um, and going over these plans. Um, it will come back to us at some point. Yes, they will. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Okay, great. Then um, we are moving on to item um, to B2. And this is the discussion of the schedule for the district wide master planning. So I will turn it back to you. We need new um, presentation. New presentation. Um, and West Winds enrollment is 368 right now. And how many classrooms per grade then did you say? Three. So Westwood, I believe, is three. Is that right, Maria? Yeah. Three. Are we moving to are we moving to B facility master plan schedule? So while they're bringing up the PowerPoint, um, I'll just give a brief overview of this presentation. And this presentation is to let you know where we are um, and where we're going with our facility master plan that I'm working on as part of Vision 2035 and um, with the site analysis. And so um, this presentation really is something that we have been thinking about as we're developing the master plans for Briarwood, Bracker, Westwood, and Scott Lane that we've been presenting to you. And we've realized that we need to, in order to incorporate some of the values and some of the things that we're talking about in Vision 2035, we really need to take a little bit of a step back and, and go and um, evaluate some of these items and those items would be the special ed and and would be early childhood um, education and so I do want to say quite clearly that we are not saying to slow down on Laurelwood at all um, this would only affect some of the other larger projects in the other uh, master plans and that we're still moving full steam ahead with Laurelwood great all right so So one of the things that as we're going through all these um, all these master plans and, and discussing these with the community and the site staff and the students is we're really looking at our district priorities. And those district priorities are basically how to make things better and how to analyze them. And that's what we're trying to do with these master plans. Michelle, can we hold on one second? Is the Zoom and the live stream in sync with what she's presenting? Okay, we wanna make sure we're in sync. No, I know that, but they didn't seem to have the right presentations up on all of them. Just wanna make sure. Um, so part of the Vision 2035, it has a, a smaller section in it that really focuses on education and, and what we've been discussing at a district level is what should 
our schools look like, not what have they been looking like and not what are other people doing, but what do we want to teach and what do we want, how do we want to transform our students to be, to be able to graduate with the graduate portrait and our staff to become that adult portrait and the systems portrait. And so those are things that we're talking about and we really want to as I wrote down here, disengage from what's not working. So just because we've been designing something the same way year after year after year doesn't mean it's right. And so we've been starting those conversations and those are the conversations that we wanna to continue to have throughout the summer and potentially into the fall that incredibly affect these master plans that we're doing. Some of the core values that we're really looking forward and discussing is the students first. What is it that we want the students? What do we want the environment to look like? Um, what do we want those future facilities to look like? And what are we what are we teaching? Or la at the last board meeting, you all heard the very eloquent students from elementary and middle schools read the climate resolution. And I think that's something that is very, the students are passionate about it. It's something that we're gonna be incorporating in all of our buildings that we're doing and we're incorporating in our master plans, but how far we wanna go, we haven't quite determined that yet. And so those de decisions on these master plans and the buildings still need to be determined. Additionally, reaching out to the communities. And so, so far we've had um, a minimum of two community meetings with each of these schools. Um, and they really, we've gotten some great feedback. And I know especially Bracker, the community there has been great. Um, and they, that school really wants to be a community hub. And um, so reaching out into the community and finding out what that means for them. And if that means that we have some extra classrooms that they can use after hours for adult programs, for English as a second language, for citizenship classes, everything that they did before COVID happened. And so if we're gonna start doing that to support that local community, we need to make those decisions so that we can make sure we have enough classrooms, that we're supporting everyone um, and that we have the correct facilities for each of those neighborhoods and each of those communities. And of course, school pride, because that's the most important thing. Um, curb appeal and knowing that they're going to a school that has a fantastic maker space or a great music room or a great art room. And it's something they're really passionate about, STEM and nature and learning gardens. I think that's something that um, we're, we're discussing and trying to look at examples that other schools have done well, um, especially having tactile gardens, or um, I know some of them have, for the special ed, they'll have different sensory gardens. And so those are different things that we're looking at and seeing where we can place them in our master plans to create more school pride so that everything is universally accessible. So one of our core values is world leading and future ready. And in order to do that, we really have to dig down deep and discover what Vision 2035 is and how we get there. And so we're kind of taking that step back. And this is my proposal to you is to say, we'd like to take that step back on some of these master plans on Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood and Scott Lane, and have some of these discussions so that we know what the students need. We know where we wanna go with it. And this is our one opportunity. This is a great amount of Vaughn money and we wanna do something, we wanna do it correctly. So we wanna make sure that we've almost exhausted all of our options before we end up building anything. What my specific portion of Vision 2035 is, is future ready, working and learning environments. And as I presented to you previously, we're doing a facilities conditions assessment. We are looking at the different spaces, what we need. I'm connecting with nutrition services. I'm connecting with special ed. I'm connecting with um, early childhood, family child ed, and really figuring out what types of spaces we need. 
And with that, we really want to make research based decisions. So we want to make sure that um, we are really looking at all the different types of early childhood learning environments. What do we want that to look like for Santa Clara Unified? What is special ed going to look like for Santa Clara? What is what types of facilities are we going to have on every campus? Are we going to have a STEM makerspace? Are we going to have a music room? Are we going to have an art room that's just dedicated to those? Are we going to combine some of them? And those are some of the facility questions that we'll be asking what is important to us. One of the major decisions that we have been discussing is early childhood learning. And we, have, we are deciding between two different options. Maybe it becomes a hybrid, but one of our first option is every site has early childhood education. So every site, which is how we do it now, has, well, almost every site now, has preschool, they will have TK and K. And there's definitely pros and cons to that. The, the pros are that those students are there. They're there from preschool all the way through fifth grade. There's continuity and they get to meet amongst their peers and they get to go to their community school. However, it does dilute some of the staff support and it makes building some of those classrooms. I mean, preschool classrooms are expensive to build. Um, TK classrooms are expensive to build because they require the bathrooms, they are bigger. Um, and they each have very specific plans for those outdoor spaces, um, preschool especially. It's 75 square feet per student. It, they have to have shade. They have to have water. They have to have lots of things that we would design. But having to do that at every single site makes it more expensive. The other option is to combine those and potentially have two maybe more school sites with early childhood education on them. And so maybe we take a lesser used site in the South or one of our sites that is not currently being used for, for SUSD uses. And we turn that into a, an early learning or an early education school site. And so it could potentially have um, t preschool through K, preschool TK, and we would have a, a campus that was just for that. So it would include the special ed classrooms for that. It would include the playgrounds and everything would be mini. It would be so cute. Um, the whole campus would be tiny for tiny people. Um, and, and it would give them that sense of belonging because there aren't those bigger kids. But that also means parents may have to drive further. We may have to provide transportation. It's you don't build that community that you would get having those little kids from preschool all the way through to fifth grade. And you can't buddy up. Um, you can't have the fifth graders go down and help the little ones read as much or, or have big, big buddies. Um, so that's one of the decisions that we as a district need to really encompass and discuss thoughtfully and look at different options and decide which option works best for us. And this decision would severely impact, especially Westwood, Bracker, Briarwood, um, because the child development is part of those master plans and it takes up a lot of space and it's, it's a lot of real estate. And so if we, if we free up that area, then it allows us to maybe move things around and put things in a different location. If we keep it, then it's even more, how can we incorporate these so that these programs are no longer just oh, you're a different department, so I'm not even going to include you on my email list. Um, we really are looking to integrate everything together. The next decision that I have been hinting to is special education and, and where we want to go. We know that we want to go for more inclusion. We know that we still need some special ed classrooms on some sites. Is it going to be every site? Is it going to be some sites? And what goes into those areas? Are they gonna, in our mod severe classes, are we gonna have an extra playground that maybe is a sensory playground for them that is accessible directly outside their classroom like we do for kindergarten? Um, are we going to put them all together or will they be spread out on the campus? And we know that we need bathrooms in them. We know that we need 
changing areas for them. And so planning for that is important because we also know they need bigger classrooms. And um, so it just takes up more space. So some of the items that we're looking at for elementary facilities is, is that early childhood learning. Um, are we going to determine that music is really important and we wanna invest money on every campus to have a, an actually acoustical <laughs> room for music? Um, do we wanna have art? What about how much multi-purpose and the stage and does that music room then combine with the stage so that when they do performances, those students can just grab their instruments directly from that classroom and come out on the stage and they can have a bigger space. Um, what do the outdoor learning spaces look like? We keep talking about it, but we really wanna know what it looks like. I know my envision is having a solar shade structure and having seating underneath it with connections to the solar panels so they can see how much electricity it's building. And this, the teachers can easily bring a class out, maybe two classes. How many of these outdoor teaching areas and learning spaces do we want? Do we want them closer to the library? Do we want them closer to the STEM lab? Um, we've had great conversations about how we want to um, combine that makerspace STEM lab with the garden. And so you have those roll up doors and you can kind of go straight out into the garden. Um, it's something we've been talking about with Laurelwood, which is just when we said, where do we put the garden? Oh, maybe it should go next to STEM. It's like, yes, it should. And so I think that's something that as we continue these conversations, we're gonna continue to have these great ideas and that just benefits the students. And of course, we're thinking about campus safety always. So my proposal is to slow down a little bit on Bracker, Briarwood, Westwood, and still move forward with the projects that won't get impacted by these decisions. We would still move forward we're still we're moving forward with fencing no matter what um but maybe putting in shade structures for them uh putting in new play structures as long as they're not in the way of a potentially new building and potentially maybe parking lot improvements depending on what it is and so each of these school sites would be a little bit different on what we move forward with and what we would end up planning for next summer because really we're we're looking at putting in shade structures and maybe um, moving their garden or improving their garden if it's not in phase one. Um, and the security upgrades are moving forward no matter what, but we would still move forward with those projects. And then instead of right away figuring out whether the multipurpose goes first or the classroom building goes first, we would have some of these discussions over the next six months. And then we would come to a conclusion and pick back up these master plans and say, okay, sites, we now have a decision. We now are doing early childhood education on every site or none of your sites. Um, and so once those decisions have been made, then we'll be able to really get in and make a master plan that's more meaningful for these campuses and, and really then figure out how to move forward with the projects that are in, um, are in Measure BB and with that, we are going back to each school site. Once again, ask them what's most important to you. Is it your multi? Is it your two-story classroom building? Is it your maker space? What is it? Because we've we've found that the different schools are very different. Um, and I think that's great. Um, each one views different aspects of the student learning and early and childhood education differently. And we want to respect that. What I'm looking for tonight is um, maybe a thumbs up, thumbs down, a, an overall consensus of whether we stay the course, which would be finishing up these master plans next month and moving forward with them. We, would, we could adjust the course and maybe stall them a little bit and move forward with those quick start projects for next summer and then stall for the six months while we have these conversations, the district figures out where we wanna go in alignment with 2035 and really how to make this district fantastic. And then I'm up for other options. So with that, I open it up for questions.
Okay, thank you very much for that. Can I get a time check? 26 minutes left. Okay, good. Um, so we'll start with Trustee Raderman, then Trustee Lieberman. Thank you, President Mira. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this approach. Um, one of the things that's been concerning me for a while is it felt I felt like we were on an artificial timeline. And <clears throat> I actually anticipated a little bit of a showdown because of that. Um, I think the idea of going back to the basics, it's a, uh, my, a phrase I've used before, it's about the kids. What's the right thing to do for the kids? What are the right things to do going forward? The facilities shouldn't drive the pedagogy, the pedagogy should drive the facilities. And so uh, I am very much in favor of, let's, let's take our time, let's do this right, let's slow down. If the, there's some things in here that you mentioned we should do right away, fencing was a pretty obvious one, security. But I would say that I like the idea of trying to be sure that we do things purposefully, intentionally, and, and with some thought to it. So um, kudos, I'm very much in favor of the approach you're suggesting. I think you're suggesting you may be trying to take a neutral spot, but I think you're actually suggesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ms. Lieberman. Thank you, President Muirhead. Thank you, Ms. Healy. I love your presentations. <laughs> um, I just have a quick question. I was just wondering if we had considered creating a central ECE campus that would be like a learning center. So that's pretty much what these would be. We would just have one in the north and one in the south. Okay. So, so yeah. That's so they wouldn't be spread out among different campuses. It would it would be a northern ECE center and then a southern center. And then everything would be built around, they'd be their own separate facility. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I like that idea actually a lot. Um, I think it makes sense for the littles um, teaching in a, you know, you know, I'm at the private preschool on the campus and it, it's hard when everything's built for big kids. Um, so I, that idea is really, is really a, a good one, I think. Okay, thanks. Trustee mm -hmm. Fairchild. Thanks, uh, President Muirhead. Um, I'm actually gonna respectfully disagree with Trustee Lieberman. Um, I, as when we, when I think about our students who are furthest from opportunity and their ability to access preschool, I think preschools need to be close to their homes. Um, I remember trying to get to preschool and elementary school with my own two girls and it took, I, and I had, a, I had a car, I didn't have work conflicts and I had two friends who we were, had to maintain a very intricate carpool to get our kids to elementary and preschool. So I think when you have those on separate campuses, you immediately eliminate some of our families that need the preschool. And so I... There's a part of me that would love this early learning center, but the other part of me knows that we will be eliminating families from that option because they will have to be able to get there from their homes. And so I, I, we're not making the decision tonight, but I did want to say that because um, I don't think we can provide transportation to these early learning, if we created an early learning center. Now, if we could provide transportation, that would be a different story, but we all have experienced the transportation nightmare and most parents don't wanna put three-year-olds on a bus anyway. So um, that being said, I just, I just feel very strongly about bringing it as close to some of our families as we possibly can. And that neighborhood school is the, it's very um, important for that. Um, my other comment is, um, one of the issues that has come up also in a lot of the special ed commentary we've received this year is the difference in the life skills facilities at the two high schools. And um, that for some of those students, they need access to kitchens and, and training um, areas where they can practice those life skills. And so I really like that we could maybe look at that um, because it sh you should have equity of access at both schools. Uh, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you for the report. I totally agree with uh, Trustee Fairchild as far as uh, 
I think the concept of having great ECE sites is is great, but um, accessibility for our parents is is uh, you know as soon as I'm going to be able to get there, it's not going to matter how great the school is. So uh, I think uh, that's an aspect that um, maybe if we had it at, at all of our Title One sites or or something where there's not just two, it might be beneficial. But um, otherwise, I mean, it's almost like just keep it as close to those those parents. Many times might not have two cars, are impacted by work, and and we definitely want to have those students in class, you know, as early as possible, so that when they do get to to the uh, you know K through twelve, that they're they're really prepared. Um, the other thing, uh, as far as the adjustment, I think the adjustment is fine. You know, whatever data, new data we have, we can we can work with that, and maybe do some of the. Uh, the projects that are the lower hanging fruit and uh, benefit some of those sites that we've just talked about. I think that that, that aspect of it, I think is is always uh, it's always needed to make sure that we spend our uh, our dollars in a meaningful way and make them stretch as much as possible. And uh, I know that we didn't. This was this the, the master plan. Probably doesn't talk about some of the things that we've mentioned in some of the bond projects, such as a. Uh, the uh, tennis courts at Wilcox, the bleachers at Wilcox, but definitely those are things that we have to, especially the tennis courts, you know, an issue of equity where our, our students from Wilcox won't have those facilities and have to go across town to use those. So, so if we got to get that back, back on the docket here or talk, bring, bring Larry in, we, we need to make sure that we address some of those issues with, uh, with the tennis courts and um, it might be beneficial to do the, uh, the bleachers at the same time as well. So I will say that um, the board has given Larry a direction to have the tennis courts designed. Um, and so they are getting designed. They, they will not go out to bid um, without board approval. And we are in the process of getting some assessments of the bleachers right now so that we'll then have a more comprehensive idea of how much it'll cost to renovate or put in new bleachers at the two, both high schools. So it'd be great if we had that some, sometime sooner. Especially yeah. as, as summer comes around, I know we do a lot of work over the summer and try to be as less impactful to students during the school year. Yeah, I know um, the consultants are working on that right now. Okay, okay so, um, Trustee Ryan, do you want to go? Yeah, so um, I, I'll echo, um, thank you so much for the presentation, and I'll echo uh, Trustee Gonzalez and Trustee Fairchild on the, on the early childhood as much as, again, I would love to see centralized specialized facilities, um, even from personal. I mean, I, I know that it benefits lots of families, but my own family, it was wonderful to be able to help our preschooler and our elementary schooler on the same campus. Uh, the preschooler loved it too, because she thought she was going to school and just like her big brother, her bigger brother. So, um, but uh, um, I'd like to see the direction things are going and I, I loved hearing the ideas. So thank you so much. Okay. Um, uh, I um, respectfully um, disagree with Trustee Lieberman, and I feel so bad about that because she is a preschool educator, and so um, I, I really value your opinion on it. But I also um, think about um, our many families who couldn't handle the transportation if it was across town to um, an early childhood center, and and uh, so I, I have to think about making sure that the kids can get to the school. Um, you can't educate them if they don't show up. So, um, so I do think that um, that's gonna be important um, that, the, that the early childhood be convenient for the families who need it. Um, and then uh, I, I hear what you're saying about um, the impact on our three um, big project schools Bracker, Briarwood, Westwood, or BBW, um, but they haven't gotten anything yet. And so I really do appreciate that while all of our elementary schools um, that hadn't gotten new play structures now have them and they have shade structures and they have fencing and those three schools don't have those. So the idea of going forward with those, um, those singular projects where they don't impact, I think is a good idea. I think 
um, talking to that those communities to figure out what's important to them, whether it's the new NPR, the new admin building, new classrooms, find out what they think is first, because I think that it's clear there's going to need to be phasing on these projects. Um, so figuring out what those phases are, good luck with that one. Um, but I, I do think that that's important. Um, and are, are we starting with some of those upgrades this summer or next summer? Next. So the fencing is going to DSA this summer, and then we're hoping to put it in. Um, for the most part, we can do it once kids are in, in school. So we'll be starting that as soon as we can, um, but it'll most likely be in the fall. And then everything else, we will. it'll take us a while to design it and get it approved because that's a full submittal. So that'll take us a year basically to get it ready to and bid it. And so then um, the playgrounds and shade structures would go in uh, next summer, in summer 23. Summer 23, okay. So um, Ms. Healy was looking for consensus around um, holding off, uh, delaying the, the BBW projects, right? That or versus just going forward before the general idea of what an elementary campus looks like. And um, so I do kind of want to get consensus on that. Um, Trustee Rennerman, do you have a comment about that or about something else? Maybe I can get consensus so on the one. It was, it, 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 I think it's about that. Okay, go So ahead. one of the things we saw happen right here, I think is really valuable. There was pretty one topic that sort of dominated, had to do with the consolidation of classes. And I think that that conversation would have, there would be many conversations on many topics. I think are important to figure out. So earlier, I com for instance, on the one that came up, I did want to put this comment forward. It seems to be there a degree of consensus that if you could have the larger larger campus and you could solve the, the access problem, that would be the preferred. And then if you can't, then no, we should distribute. So to my way of thinking, part of the challenge would be, let's take a look and see if there's any solution to the access problem. And then we'll probably be in a, probably pretty quickly make a decision. But on the larger thing, I think we do need to take the time to look through the different areas, look at the look at what's going to be best for our kids, and, and try to put that long lens on where we're looking 10, 20 years down the road, because that's what we're building for. So my comment towards hoping that we get to consensus is let's slow down, let's take all the necessary steps as uh, Ms. Healy suggests, is possibly suggested. Okay, so maybe I can just get a thumbs up consensus on um, slowing down so we can do uh, some of these decisions about what an elementary campus looks like before finalizing um, Briarwood, Brecker, and, and Westwood. I have a thumbs up if, if you're okay with delaying those until we're ready. Um, okay, I see consensus on that of all seven. So that's good to, good to make that decision. Okay, um, Trustee Fairchild, you have another comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that I was struck by, because when we were kind of pushing forward this whole master plan, um, there was a lot of concerns about going too fast. Do you remember that? And um, I kind of felt like I was not appreciated because I was the one sharing that opinion. And um, I appreciate we need to look at it. And we need to look at it not only for okay, future, and you know, we're like, oh, are we, may, are we aligning with Vision 2035? I think the bigger issue is, is our enrollment, is are our plans aligning, aligning with our enrollment? And um, we have declining enrollment, who knows, maybe we might, we might see a change next year, but we need to be designing and looking at that. And so I'm glad to see an, an adjusting of the course because we were talking about schools in the 200s. And, and we need to really, really talk about that. And the, the, we might end up having hard conversations next year, which is why I, I, I'm glad we're doing this. Um, I also wanted to make a, a point regarding our Title I students is sometimes we refer to Title I schools. Some of our non-Title I schools have a greater number of Title I students than our Title I schools because of the enrollment. So they might not reach the percentage threshold to be Title I 
because if you're looking at a school of 200 and you have 40%, that's much smaller than if you have a school of 500 and you might only have 30%, but you have a more Title I students than the entire other school. So I think we need to be careful that we look at the, what I always say, the N, because that's a whole chunk of our, our population. And we have, and coming from Ponderosa, where we have a large school, we're not Title I, but we have a lot of Title I students. And so I don't want us to forget that and just dismiss those schools because those kids need services too. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you need other direction from us? Nope. That's what you wanted. Awesome. Just staying up here for my next report. Okay. So before we do that, I want to make sure there's no public comment on this item B.2. I don't see any slips. Is there anyone in the community who wants to speak on B.2? Okay. Um, if you're on the Zoom, now would be the time to raise your hand on B.2 about the facilities master plan. And I just want to point out to the board that there is now an uh, email about the document for public written comments. So you can get that if you haven't already. Okay, then we are moving on to item B.3, discussion of the Laurelwood Elementary Master Plan, specifically its capacity. So I will turn it back to Ms. Healy. So some of this is um, repetitive from last time, but I added additional information and some of this is new um, from requested information. And there was a question that I wanna point out, I answered in the response to questions. Um, and it was a question on where are the students going um, when they leave Laurelwood. And so um, as you can see, they're going to other districts in California, they're going to private schools, they're going outside California, and there's actually a large percentage of them that are going to other countries. So um, that information is there for you, and I found it quite interesting. And if the public wants to see that, it'll be in the, um, uh, what's that section called? Uh, answers to board member questions on the agenda. It'll get posted. There is not a section for that in this, in this one. There's there is not, not a section to post the answers to board member questions. Oh, so Dr. Kemp, where can where how will we um, put that onto the agenda? We could do it under um, number one. Okay, and just to add. Uh, is that where you put it, Jean? She did it under B one. Oh, so it's already there. Oh, under B one. B one or A one. B one. B one. Okay, so it's up there under B one if you'd like to see it. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. So I do want to um, give some additional information on our declining enrollment. And this really is one thing we were just talking about and it is district wide and um, for the most part. And so these are the changes and this is just our attendance boundary. I know at the last uh, meeting I had information that was more county based, um, but one of our demographics uh, companies is able to get me that information just for our attendance boundary. And so as you can see the district itself from 2018 to 2000, 2008 to 2016 has decreased 9%. And the boundary births just for the Laurelwood attendance boundary have decreased 18%. And some other um, attendance boundaries in our area have also decreased um, more than Laurelwood, less than Laurelwood. Um, it was interesting. Um, one of the questions that Ms. Fairchild asked me to address in the last one was how many students um, who are, how many students in the 2018 projections were um, supposed to attend Laurelwood. And I realized that the reason I didn't include it is because the demog demographer at that point didn't include it either. So um, these numbers are the same numbers as I had last time. Um, 
And then in the 21 and actually starting in 2019, the demographer started including those numbers. So um, it was just those 2018s. So we do have two different types of projections that we use. We use conservative and, and moderate. And the conservative are based off of Mr. Tom Williams, student generation rates coming from um, his analysis that he does for us on our enrollment projections. And then the The moderate projections are coming from our um, decision insight, and they do their separate projections. Um, and those also, they have slightly different student generation rates, although they are mostly the same. Um, we are still seeing a 0 0.03 out of coming out of new apartments. So for every 100 apartments, we really are seeing um, three students, and that's coming out of our new apartments. Um, and if anyone ever wants to find out how many students we're getting from any different apartment complex, feel free to contact me. Um, our systems allow me to actually be able to pinpoint. I can tell you what schools they go to. I can go. I can tell you um, what grades they're in. And it really is interesting um, for us. And so um, we are seeing we are seeing that declining enrollment. I did change this chart a little bit from the last one, and this is the student enrollment in the Laurelwood attendance boundaries, K-5. And in this one, I made it a little bit clearer to include the students who are open enrolling. Um, and so as you can see from October of 2016 down to April of 2022, the difference between the K-5 students residing in the Laurelwood attendance boundary and the number of students who are actually attending Laurelwood from the Laurelwood attendance boundary. And then that next column is students open enrolling from Laurelwood to another school, and then students open enrolling to Laurelwood that are attending Laurelwood. So um, you can see where we are in that, and I know you had that open enrollment uh, presentation from last meeting. But either way, you can see that the K-5 students within the attendance boundary, as well as attending Laurelwood are decreasing and have been decreasing year after year. And that started before COVID hit. As we summarized last time, there are three scenarios that we will, I will be discussing tonight and we will be discussing. And scenario one is building a school for 650 students. And that really was a, a base of 600 and then adding special ed and adding TK would get us up to that um, 650 amount. And then scenario two is the 650 students. So classrooms for 650 plus enlarged facilities, the multipurpose would be bigger, the, um, and it would be sized more for closer to 800, the administration and student services, the wellness center would be larger. Um, and so we could plan a location for an additional permanent classroom if we ever needed it. And then scenario three is the 800 student capacity and the whole site then would be um, built for 800 students. In two slides, we'll be discussing the cost estimates. And there were some assumptions that we took when we were making these cost estimates. And what we've been seeing is that construction project cost is costing around $1,200 a square foot. So that is today's construction costs um, for schools. Um, this, this coincided with um, Swinerton Builders, Construction Management's estimating department, as well as um, an architect um, who just finished building a school in Foster City. Um, and that was HMC, who's also designing Laurelwood. So they also are seeing throughout the Bay Area $1,200 a square foot. Um, and what we designed to is just about 130 square feet per student.
The other cost estimate assumptions are that, um, and this is pretty basic, um, this goes on with what how architects design buildings and it's similar to what we designed at Agnew with that support space. And so it's 92 square feet of students. Um, and that's kind of subtracted from the 130. Um, the inflation is a, is a semi-educated guess. Um, we don't know where it's going. It was um, 2% in 2018. It was 4% in 19. It was 3% in 20 um, or 20. When we get to 21, it jumped to 14%. So we really don't know where it's going. Um, and so we wanted to just have a consistency in the 8%, 8%, and 7% because we just don't know. So in order to see any of these costs decrease, we would need to see either more materials on the supply market, more labor, um, something has to change for these numbers to decrease. So cost estimates. Scenario one is the 650 students. And um, I do wanna say that when Mr. Adams was working on what was gonna be included in the bond, um, and the facility needs task force was talking about this. They decided that the, the optimal school for Patrick Henry for the bond would be a 600 student school. And so that is what the cost estimate in the measure BB was for. And that was decided prior to there being discussions about Laurelwood having one school, two schools, a large school, so that decision happened more in July and August of 2018 um, before any of those conversations had really started taking place yet because we had to lock in those numbers with the county, um, with the um, state and what we were gonna have on the ballot because those all have to be approved in August. So the cost estimate for the bond language, it says it a new school on the Patrick Henry site, and that is for 600 students. So the cost estimates that we have do increase that amount for those additional students. Um, so because we decided after the bond was passed in 2019 that we wanted one larger school at Patrick Henry, instead of taking the existing Laurelwood and modernizing it and having two smaller schools, which would have been able to accommodate um, that 11, basically 11 million reconfiguration of existing Laurelwood to have one school and then Patrick Henry would be built for a 600 student or less school and that would be the 87 million. So since now we've decided that there's one large school, we've combined those two and take in that money from the Laurelwood reconfiguration and put that towards the Patrick Henry New School. And so currently there is um, 98 million that we have in Measure BB allocated for Laurelwood and the new Laurelwood, excuse me. Um, so to get to the actual amount that we would need for 650 students, we need to add that 20 million. So the 20 million is a combination of inflation, and it's the combination of the 7%, 8% that I spoke about earlier, and it's a combination of adding those additional 50 students to the Patrick Henry New School allocation from Measure BB. Um, and so the cost estimate assumptions that were on the previous two slides were all combined and that's how we got the 20 million. And then the scenario two, it's added on those larger facilities and that's where um, we're getting the 41 million and to build the entire scenario three, which is really just adding additional classrooms to scenario two, um, it's almost that 50 million. Measure BB does have some scope reserve as well as escalation reserve, and that's on slide 11. So 
part of measure BB has a separate pot of money for scope reserve. So we would be able to take those additional 50 students to go from the 600 students to 650 students and take some of that out of the scope reserve that is part of the bond for changes in projects. And then the escalation reserve, that money would be used for the inflation cost. So when the original um, estimates were being done for Measure BB, the 87 million was for a new school at Patrick Henry that would be in mid construction in 2021, which was what the original plan was. So that's why we had to escalate it because now we'll be in midpoint construction in 24. And so we've increased those with the escalation. So as you can see in scenario one, scenario two and scenario three, how much money that leaves in the reserve for other escalation. Um, and I will point out that the, um, as I mentioned in the response to some questions, that the Measure BB funds, those funds were not escalated in the Measure BB bond because they, we didn't know when we would start construction. So that amount of the reserve would be covered by the escalation reserve. And it's, it's still, the math all works out. And that's the point of having that escalation reserve in the bond is to accommodate those additional, um, the extended time that it takes to build some of these things. So the remaining reserves, you can see what they are dependent on the three different scenarios. So other potential uses for the measure BB reserves, and this would be the scope reserve, could be doing more at Bracker, Briarwood, Westwood, all projects that are named in the bond, as well as potentially doing not only the Peterson, what we would call the football field, but also doing the multi-use field, putting in an all-weather track, bleachers and or a field house, and the New Valley relocation. And those are all items that are really talked about in the bond language. Other allowable projects under the bond, but not explicitly stated, but could be and would fit underneath some of the different generic headings like replacing portables with permanent buildings um, and those types of different projects are other options that we would have for the scope portion of the uh, Measure BB reserves. And so those, could in, those would include the tennis, Wilcox, potentially Santa Clara tennis courts, um, and Scott Lane, we could build a new classroom building there, um, Cabrillo classroom building, maybe improvements for the YAC. Um, modernization is, is allowable under Measure BB. Um, reconfiguring the existing Laurelwood because once Laurelwood moves out, we don't know what we're gonna put there. So right now there isn't any money allocated for that reconfiguration and structural strengthening of some of the canopies at the elementary schools that we haven't been able to do yet. as a summary, um, basically birth rates are declining, student enrollments are declining district-wide. Um, the original Measure BB money had the new school at Patrick Henry and that was budgeted for 600 students. Any additional construction will require using the Measure BB supplemental reserve funds. And as you can see, it's summarized again as how much we're estimating for each of the different scenarios of how much money we would need to take out of the scope and escalation. So it's kind of a combination of the two um, and how much money we would be taking out of those reserves. So the last slide really says, um, which of the three scenarios should the district use for the capacity of the new Laurelwood Elementary School? And I am ready for questions because I know there was a lot of information in that presentation. So much information. Okay. So we will um, 
start with um, a round from the board. So we'll start with Trustee Fairchild. Thank you, Ms. Healy. It was a lot of information. Um, one of the things, very well done. One of the things that I was um, looking at when we got all the questions in our last um, time this came up was what it said about Laurelwood in our project list. And it says special ed facilities. Has that been defined? I mean, because to me, it seems like it would mean not just a resource room, you know. We're planning for uh, three special education classrooms at Laurelwood. Okay. Um, because I, I want to make sure that we honor that um, and that, again, saying we, we want those classrooms in the school. <laughs> um, my question to you is also regarding allowable projects. And you, um, I, you mentioned specific projects at, at schools. Are projects allowed at other schools if they're modernization, such yes. as like the life skills classes at Santa Clara High. Yeah. Okay, just throwing that out there. <laughs> it's it's just something we've heard a lot. So um, thank you. Uh, Trustee Canova. Uh, refresh me on scenario two um, that has the capacity to, to grow in the future, correct? So if we needed to, to increase the capacity, we could. So scenario two would be building classrooms for 650. We would allocate space on the site for an additional classroom building in the future. And we would build the multi-purpose, the administration, the wellness center, cafeteria, um, those auxiliary spaces to hold 800. You, you're wanting to hear from us where our thoughts are. Um, for me, scenario two seems most attractive. Uh, considering the original uh, goal from the measure, which was 600 students, um, the ability to expand this campus as needed in the future, because we don't know the long-term future. We, we, you know, right now we see the declining enrollment, but in five years or 10 years, it could be completely reversed. So we would have the capacity to expand, whereas in scenario three, if you build an 800 capacity school, um, it's not easy to downsize on um, your you have an 800 capacity school so it seems scenario two is a sweet spot for me okay well i'll go um i um i was also thinking about scenario two because it gives you the flexibility it's always nice to have a bigger npr and administration student services i mean you can use that um but it didn't seem to make sense to build a whole building um, at this point. But I was, um, I'm having a hard time wrapping myself around the difference in cost because you're either way you're building an empty, you're, you're building those spaces, you're just making them a little bit bigger. And yet you went from 120 million to 140 million, another $20 million. But then to build a whole new building, you're only adding another 8 million. I, I explain. I, I, I'm, don't get it. Classroom buildings are cheaper than admin spaces with offices and multi-purpose with high ceilings and um, more structural steel and larger kitchens. Um, those types of facilities are more expensive. And so um, it it's more square footage, even though the classrooms seem like they um, should be a lot of square footage, it's really not that much square footage when you're considering adding on the um, the auxiliary spaces and I can get you the exact um, square footages that we used. And, and just to confirm then if we um, don't do the extra building now and we come back later, it'll only cost us $8 million to build that building? Less escalation. That's How many, however many years of, of inflation and material cost increases it would be. That seems like nothing. I mean, um, I mean, it's still $8 million, almost $9 million that we could use for something else. But um, yeah, you could buy a house. Um, OK, so um, you also had, um, yeah, there's a question there. OK, I guess that, that'll do it for me. Trustee Redman. 
Yeah, I always feel awkward on this particular topic because, as you know, I, I opposed this. I was the only one that voted against the large school. And my preference was always two smaller schools. I think it's better for the kids. I think it's better for the community. But that wasn't the decision the board took. So based on what the decision the board took, which is to build a single school, if you look at the scenarios one, two, and three, um, you either do one or you do three, you don't do two, because the $8 million, by the time you add inflation, when you ever get around to it, it's gonna be, you might as well have just built the things right off the bat. So, um, you know, anyway, my, my feeling is that you either build the 800 or the 650. The problem with the 650, you have to then question why you're, why you are not just fixing up Laurelwood. Um, so again, I'm gonna be unpopular, but those are my thoughts, thanks. Um, Trustee Gonzalez. My thoughts are in line with Trustee Radman, but I thought I would be more in line for scenario one as far as uh, the enrollment projections, but remind us as far as the Hamptons, I know that um, they were anticipating doing something different and they're not. You kind of refresh us on that? Yeah, so the Hamptons are still waiting to see what happens with um, the Valco Center and how many units Cupertino allows in the Valco Center, really how many units the community allows in Valco because um, they're still kind of working that all out. And so the Irvine company had originally planned on building a large amount of units and the city didn't really want them to build that many because as I, I'll refresh you, that's our one portion of Cupertino that we're in. And so the city, they struck a deal with the city that basically said, if you can build this many units, if Valco has no units and, um, or whatever that number is. And so part of the discussion was what Irvine company originally wanted to do um, those apartments would have been mostly studios and one bedrooms, but they were too tall and you could see over the fence into the Apple complex. And so Apple, <laughs> Apple um, got the city to make them reduce the height of their buildings, thus by reducing quite a bit of the apartments that they were planning on building there in the studios and one bedrooms, which also ha would have a direct access to the Apple campus. And so um, they then continued conversations with Cupertino to continue. Um, if, if Velco doesn't have very many, then they could go more dense on their site. But if Velco ends up having a lot of apartments, then they would have to keep at the lower number. Um, and that's still all up in the air. So right now, um, the Hamptons is staying as it is. Um, so it is two, three bedroom apartments. Um, I haven't heard anything from our vine company that anytime soon they're going to start um, developing that, but um, I, I think we all know Valco is still a little bit um, just up in the air, and so um, we don't know what's going to happen to the Hamptons in the future. Would you say, I mean, just, I know you don't have a ball, but would you say that most likely the student generation would be lessened if they went to? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, you would go from two and three bedroom apartments, townhome style apartments, to studios and one bedrooms and a few two bedrooms, but the proximity to Apple makes it so that you would just have those more engineer types and that's what they would be catering to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Single engineers, I would say, because engineers can have children too. Yes, single, <laughs> single young, young yes. engineers. Um, just out of college so that they can just walk directly through the gate into Apple. Okay, Trustee Ryan, you had something? Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. And I know when you uh, presented before, I think I was leaning to scenario two, that was before we had the numbers. So I thought that was a good compromise of the infrastructure for a larger school should be needed, but but the classroom, the classroom space for, for the 650. Um, but now that I see the numbers and I look at the list of projects, uh, that we also need in other schools. Um, uh, I, I would kind of agree with Trustee Gonzalez, you know, the one or the three, but, but I'm leaning to one because I think I see the needs throughout the district and we only have a limited pot of money to spend on those. Um, so that's, I guess, where I'm leaning. You said leaning to one, right? Okay. Um, okay, so... Um... 
everyone's had a turn and I'm inclined to go out to public comment unless, I mean, do you guys want to do another round before we go out to public comment? I know Vicki and Andy. Okay, we'll we'll do the those comments and then we'll go out to public comment. So, yeah. <laughs> so I do have some slips for this item. So if you want to speak, you can fill out a slip and get it to us. Um, if you are out on the Zoom and you want to speak, you can raise your hand. We'll get to you in just a moment. So we'll do Trustee Fairchild and sorry, time check. Sixteen minutes left. Okay, we're we're doing fine. Um, amazing, Trustee Fairchild and then Trustee Ryan. Thanks. I, I just wanted to repeat the questions I asked um, for the previous schools, and that is um, how many classes per grade and what is their current enrollment? So I think their current enrollment is in the 450. No, what is 516? Okay, 518. and 518. And how many for a 650 school, how many classes per grade? So it's four. And then at fourth and fifth, we go down to three. Okay, so it, you're planning the same number of classrooms for this school in a 650 estimation as you are for the schools that are at 200? So only for, so Briarwood and um, Briarwood is two classes per um, grade and yeah. then Westwood is three. And then, um, and those also kind of reduce down the, the Westwood would probably reduce down to two at four and five because we have higher grade numbers. And then Bracker would be similar. Um, the one difference with this one is that we're including um, a little bit more of a flex space as well as, um, so we would have that, that bubble area of, um, and we're including that special ed. Okay. All right, thank you. That, I just wanted to, I, I wanna get the whole picture. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Ryman. I, I, I wanna be careful. You spent a lot of effort trying to get enrollment projections right. And I think that nothing against what you've done, but at points of inflection where things are radically changing, uh, your ability to predict is very limited. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and if you look back to the 2008, 2009 timeframe, we saw a huge dip. I think your, even your numbers show that uh, there was a big dip right after that, the birth rates and this type of thing. And we've gone through a really traumatic experience. I mean, COVID-19 is unprecedented. And there's a lot of people making a lot of predictions. Some say that our numbers are gonna drop radically. Some say they're gonna actually bounce back and get greater than they were before. And so I'm, I'm very nervous about the numbers. Not that you didn't use due diligence. I'm not trying to criticize what you've done, but I think it's very dangerous to be making a lot of assumptions uh, on, based on predictions, on weak data. Uh, not because you did a bad job, but because who knows? I mean, there's no one out there, I think, that really has a good handle on this. I had one realtor telling me how it's going to go wild. It's crazy. You got to invest now before it just goes the roof off of it. And I've also had some folks, I pick one right next to me, telling me that the numbers are going down and not coming back up. So I just think we need to be very, very careful about what we do uh, when we look at those, those numbers and projections, um, because we've seen that drop before and we've seen it bounce back up. We also remember that at one point, this district had 24,000 kids in it when Santa Clara's population was like 70 something thousand, 70, 80,000. And that was during the baby boom. We all get that, but there's nothing saying we don't boom again. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I really wanna hear the public, what they think about this. Um, so I will um, uh, read something first. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I want to remind the public that the board has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression but only to maintain to the extent possible and reasonable, a safe harassment-free workplace for our students and staff in the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, Santa Clara Unified encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. 
the district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. Okay, we're gonna do um, public comment in the room and then we'll go out to the Zoom. So I'll read out the first three names of people I have slips for, um, and you can line up at the podium here. Uh, Janet Hazen, Mary, and Lizzie Smith. And you'll have two minutes. Um, no, I think it is uh, Mary Clank. Awesome. Good evening. My name is Janet Hayes and I am a Laurelwood parent. Um, I felt the need to provide you with additional statistics that should have been provided in that presentation as the sole use of birth rate is both a deflection for need and an outdated practice when discussing community development. Birdland, the approximate one square mile that provides the boundary for Laurelwood Elementary has a population of roughly 16,000 residents. 38% are families with children, 58% are renters, and 68% of those renters have children that are school aged. Our population is expected to grow by 7.5% over the next five years. Birdland has 1,601 apartments uh, that are currently 96% occupied. We do have 600 more units coming at Hamptons. Irvine has not canceled that project. Um, and they are planning on building one to two bedroom units that will attract more families. Yes, engineers have babies too. And there are 45 affordable and 13 BMR units, which are not Apple housing. 31% of our Birdland population currently attends K through 12. So scenario number three would allow for SCUD to add special programming like TK, special needs, ECE, as well as expand our open enrollment allowance. The decision site insight program used to pull the presentation stats presented um, can include more data and a request should be made to have all the additional census migration and special programming layers added to that model. I happen to work for the largest multifamily management company who is also the number one developer in the Bay Area. And if we were to make our decisions to build on birth rates alone, we wouldn't be building anything in the Bay Area. And so let's rethink the stats uh, being shared and make the right decision for the future. I think the phrase for tonight is let's be world leading and future ready. Ms. Hazen, if, um... If you would be able to email your statistics, I, I would be interested in seeing those. Okay, uh, Mary. I always have to take a deep breath before I do this. Okay. Good evening, board members. Yeah, this is Dr. Um, I'd like to take a step back and stop comparing 600 students versus 850 or 800 students, sorry. Um, and I'd like to go back to talk about the number of classrooms. Really, we are comparing apples and oranges. The previous existing enrollment numbers that have been presented represent K through five, 650 for K through five. And currently, Laurelwood has 27 classrooms for these, uh, for these grades. The new Laurelwood only has 22 classrooms for K through five grades, which will only have a capacity to seat 580 students. That's 100 kinder, 100 first, 100 second, 100 third, 80 for, for fourth and 80 for fifth. Past 850 K through five students, the new Laurelwood would have to cannibalize its STEM room, its music room, its art room, or have to put up portables, or send Laurelwood kids to other schools. To put this in perspective, our entire third grade right now is in portables that have been on campus for over 20 years. We talk about expanding at a later date, but the whole point is to keep these grades together in their collaboration spaces. If we build a new building somewhere else, the math of the classrooms doesn't work. We have now classrooms that are separated, not around. There are other classroom grade levels in collaboration spaces. Let's talk about construction costs. The current third grade, as I've said, four classrooms will need to be put in a new building if we reconstruct the current Laurelwood campus. We will have to rehouse third grade, collaboration spaces for kinder, adding bathrooms to three of the five kinder rooms. 
collaboration spaces for kinder, fourth grade, and fifth grade, larger multi purpose room. Mary, I'm going to have to ask you to finish your thought and then email, okay. email but the rest. in perspective, adding five new classrooms to the new Laurelwood campus somehow will cost $20 million. It doesn't make sense. Ready. Lizzie Smith. Good evening, board members and Dr. Kemp. Um, I have something just really quick to say. I I just find this a little bit frustrating. We feel like we've you've come back to us many times. I mean, we heard in the presentation that the original midpoint of construction for this campus was supposed to be 2021. So now it's 2024 because you keep coming back and asking us what should be done. They keep coming to you and asking. This has to move forward. And now we have all these other master plans and we all agree that we need to do everything we can for all the students in our district. But I feel like it's once again, pitting us against each other and trying to make our, dis our school look like a bad guy in the district, which I find very disappointing. Um, We've been fighting for this at Laurelwood for a long time. We, we fought for tiny toilets. We fought for a lot of things. And I'm concerned about the skew. I really want you guys to spend some real time looking at these things, looking at some of the information Ms. Hazen can help provide you. Um, you know, we do need a new campus. And I just, I wanna make sure that you guys are, you have all the information before you make a decision. Okay, thank you. Um, we have, uh, sorry, uh, Mary Eng du Dooley and uh, Amy Sargent. Did you want to speak on this one or on the closed session item? This one, okay. So Mary and then Amy. Thank you so much. I have a handout. I'm a speaker myself. <laughs> uh, so let me. Uh... Just, just drop it and he'll pass them on down. Thank you. I want to start out by saying, who am I? I'm a product of the best that public school can produce. I grew up living behind a, a country grocery store in rural Texas. There were six adults, two grandmas, two aunts, two uncles, five kids, all of us under the age of five, one bathroom, the toilet, was rickety. There was a hole next to it. I could see the dirt floor underneath our rural grocery store. So when I sat on that toilet, I could feel that cold breeze in the winter. I'm a poor kid, and it's because of amazing teachers. Mrs. Green loved me. I loved Mrs. Green in second grade that I was able to use that public school, and I got full scholarships to Rice University and to Stanford Business School. I had to work hard. Professionally, I was a high tech executive who became a preschool teacher four years ago. I'm also have been a CTO at the Sunnyvale Spark Charter School, K-8. I've been a teacher and substitute from K through eight throughout over the last few years as I was caregiving from my father and my uncle who died, both have died. So my heart is with poor kids, poor children. I volunteer in East Palo Alto preschools I started there two weeks before Stanford started. So even before going into the MBA program, I was working in East Palo Alto. I started a Girl Scout troop here in the SCUSD. And I made sure that there were girls in $2 million homes down to free school lunch programs. So I had girls at George Main. I had girls from Don Hall John. I had girls from Heyman and Ponderosa and Catherine Hughes. And I did 26 girls in fourth grade, which means 25 mamas. <laughs> I don't think I'll do that again. <laughs> but since 2012, I've served on SCUSD's Citizens Bonds Oversight Committee. Here's my original binder, 10 years old. I'm, I take my duties very seriously. I've met only a handful of the people on the board because I was busy working. Uh, Ms. Dooley, I'm gonna have to ask you to wind it up. Okay. So. So, so I have handed out my letter of concern. I admire the SCUSD board very much, but I'm very concerned that Measure B, which used the exact phrase in a specific project of reconfigure Laurel Wood, 
And I actually brought the audit report that we looked at, reviewed. Hey, the Ms. Dooley, Ms. Dooley, I'm yes. going to have to cut you off because we do have the letter and you've gone past your two minutes. The specific project is reconfigure Laurel Wood, not change the parcel number address. And I'm concerned about the difference that we're treating people like Scott Lane students versus Laurel Wood. Scott Lane is 20 years older. And if you've ever visited that school as I have, you'll know it's far worse shape. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Amy Sargent. Uh, as you've heard tonight, enrollment has been going down in the district wide, and it's my understanding that's due to things that are not necessarily um, necessarily Mr. R uh, Trustee Ratterman has shared, not necessarily going to keep going down. Uh, this is also just a beautiful place to live, beautiful weather to live in, um, and people will always want to live in the Bay Area of California. Uh, I moved to this district when I when it was time for me to consider which school my kids would attend. Um, yes, I grew up poor, but I also worked hard, got the ability to buy a home in a neighborhood with a good school and a good district. And so I tell you that because I intentionally chose which school my kids could go to. I moved in after they were born. So again, birth rates and birth, you know, your county projections, your, uh, the birth rate should not be a, a reliable factor on projected enrollment numbers. Uh, the open enrollment out of Laurelwood that you'll see in those numbers um, start at 2016, which is when Central Park opened, which a lot of the people went to Central Park School, which increased the um, number of open enrollment leaving Laurelwood. Um, if you looked at numbers before that, you would see that there was less people leaving Laurelwood to go to a different school for open enrollment. Um, just like my family didn't land at Laurelwood by mistake, it was an intentional choice, a choice that many more families will make to choose open enrollment into Laurelwood once a new facility opens up. So I want you to consider that as well. Um, and if it is true that, uh, that enrollment numbers continue to decline, we need to look to other districts to see what the future holds. Other di districts choose to close schools that are not as uh, well updated, not as um, nice of facilities, not as cutting edge technology. Um, and we already know we are going to build this new Laurelwood school at the Patrick Henry site. So I want you to consider that this is a school we know will not close. And so for the whole district, we need to consider the maximum capacity in how we can build the school to make sure that there is a school big enough with the greatest facilities for the entire school in case any of those schools need to close and be consolidated into Laurelwood. Okay, is there anyone else in the room who wishes to speak on the Laurelwood capacity um, item? Okay, then we are going to go out to um, the Zoom webinar. So um, I will turn it over to Michelle. Thank you. Good evening, um, board members. My name is Ida and I am a um, SCUSD parent. I just have a couple questions. Number one, why are we pinning communities against each other? This is not the Santa Clara way. Also, is it short-sighted to build a smaller campus? What about when the school population increases? What will that cost? Are we budgeting for that? Then my other question is, where is the budget, you know, accounted for when mistakes happen? For example, the Peterson pool, which is finished, but at the moment, it cannot be used because of the ratio of one teacher to 30 students, and it's not having enough shallow area, it's unsafe. What will happen when mistakes across the district um, 
with these projects? Where will that money come from? And that's it for right now. Thank you. And that was the last hand that was. Um, just need to throw this to Dr. Kemp. Can you get back to us about the issue with the Peterson pool being too small? Not it, it doesn't have to be right now if you don't know, but. Yeah, I recall something, but I don't have the exact details. Yeah, okay, get back to us. I don't think we'd heard about that one. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, thank you all for your comments. Um, I, I, I have heard some things um, in um, emails and messages and such. I'm sure other trustees have also gotten them about um, pitting schools against each other. And I want to assure that that is nobody's intention. And, and that is not um, what we're doing here. We have, um, we have budgets for each project. We need to figure out if those budgets still fit and if we need to expand those budgets. We have, we actually, I feel like we were very um, thinking ahead when we did the bond that we put in huge reserves that we are going to use because the costs are going up, but we do have those reserves. And so I, this idea of pitting schools against each other uh, really hurts. Um, and, and I know you can feel it, but, it, but um, I, I think we need to um, be assured that that's not part of the discussion. Okay. Um, we are out of time, right? So um, is there more discussion that the board needs on this? Yeah, I see that. Um, and somehow we have to give guidance to Ms. Healy because she asked a question about us giving her um, guidance on which scenario to go forward with. So, um, so let's see if we can go another 10 or 15 minutes and see if we can come to some consensus here. Uh, Trustee Fairchild. I feel I feel very conflicted. I think we are looking at either scenario one or scenario three. Um, and, you know, you we hear all this different information, you know, don't use birth rates, use birth rates. Don't, and and um, yet we see as a district where there is declining enrollment in our district, in the county, in, in the state. Um, one of my questions, though, that as I'm thinking about it, when you say you can can you design for 800 and build for 650 and have that design ready to go if it's needed? So um, DSA approved plans are only good for five years. So if we designed it and got it approved through DSA, then we would have to start construction within most likely three to five years. Um, if we didn't get it approved, then the code changes and it wouldn't make sense to design anything. It, my father was an architect. So is it that hard to have an idea though, a blueprint of, You know, because we're, we're master planning. All, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm thinking aloud. There's just been a lot of information tonight. We're master planning all these other schools. And can we have, all right, let's say Laurelwood, let's say everyone here is right. Laurelwood's going to have a baby boom tomorrow. All right. And then suddenly we're sitting there going, well, um, so we don't know what we're going to do. Could we have built into that master plan for Laurelwood exactly what we would do to address? that baby boom should it should it happen does that make sense that yes make that's sense. exactly what we would be doing with um option number two because option number two says you build the the general spaces the npr and admin for the 800 but we could also set do aside it. space for the, for the we could also do it with option one so if we wanted to build all the facilities for 650 and we wanted we kind of we do that on our sites anyway we always say this is where additional classrooms can go in a master plan. And so we would have that set aside. We would incorporate it into the master plan so that we would know exactly where that new classroom building would go. So we could do that with option one. 
Yes. And set it, have a space. We, we build everything for 650, not 800, and set aside space for a classroom building. Yes. So that's another option. Trustee Canova. Oh, I wasn't oh, done. Sorry, sorry, she wasn't done. Sorry. <laughs> That's Go ahead. okay. Um, I'm just teasing you. Um, so I, I'm just I'm just thinking aloud because as I as far as one, we are going to build this school. We just have to determine what size we build the school. And when you're talking about a difference of 21 million, or it's 29 million between those two, there's a lot of things we could do with that 29 million dollars right now. For me, the difference of eight million is not worth making the 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 change. I I really do think you do the six fifty or you do the eight hundred. Okay, Trustee Canova. So earlier I said I liked option two, D six fifty with the capacity to get larger. However, a comment from uh, Trustee Raderman and also a parent made a really good point about. Um, so we, we get rather a bit of tunnel vision here in Santa Clara Unified. Districts around us are in really bad situations. I mean, we see it in the neighborhood where closing schools or consolidating schools. Uh, a lot of districts are in a great deal of fiscal pain. And I think that's a very valid point that if this is new construction that's going up, it has this extra capacity. You know, this board, another board in the not too distant future may be faced with that situation. And this is something that would be coming online and have that capacity. That's a very good point. And that point has changed my opinion, uh, along with the price differential that you pointed out, which is not a great price differential between the 650 plus and the 800. So I'm not gonna give you an either or response. I'm gonna say that I now support option three. Okay. You're looking for an answer. So I'm looking for an answer. All right. So there's a part of me, the cynical part of me wants to say 650 because I think eventually you may end up with two schools. The problem with that scenario is when you mothball Laurelwood and you bring it back within a certain number of years, and perhaps Michelle can tell us, you then have to ring and bring it back up to DSA standards, which cost millions. We did that with Millikan. So uh, based on everything I've heard today, uh, I would still, I would support three. That was what the decision of the board was previously. It's the most cost effective of the options um, because you know, we don't know what's gonna happen. It gives us flexibility. Granted, we might have part of the school underutilized for a while, but there's things we can do with the underutilized space. So I would say three, very reluctantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually I have to say a, a comment that I heard from the public um, also makes me lean that way because we could in the meantime use those spaces for something. And it could be, I, I don't know what, but it could be early childhood or it could be special ed or it could be something having to do with the farm or you know a, a kitchen that um, field trips could use, or, you know, we've talked about a, a bunch of different things over, over the past year or so. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I'm nervous about overbuilding um, and using that money that could, that, um, that we might not ever actually need there, but we, but we could use it for other things until the time that we might need it for more classrooms at Laurelwood. Uh, other thoughts? I'm, Trustee Ryan? Yeah, um, so I, I'll just restate what I said again, that initially I supported option two before I saw the numbers because I thought the flexibility would be good, um, but seeing the numbers and the stark numbers, um, uh, I, I don't think the difference between two and three is big enough to, to stay with option two. Um, and I appreciate, uh, Trustee Muirhead, your comments about we're not trying to pit schools against each other. That's not what this is about. The fact is, we have a limited pot of money that has to serve the whole district, and we have to make choices. Um, it has to, we have to serve the whole district. That's our role here. Um, it's just a fact that there are multiple schools with multiple needs, and we have to balance that. That's, that's our job. Um, 
And I'm really deeply concerned that we should build a bigger school because we might have to close some other schools. I don't think any other community loves their school less and is gonna be thrilled about having to close their school because we built a giant school for Laurelwood that they didn't necessarily need. I think that's gonna raise a lot of upset down the road that we're not seeing right now, but we will if we're closing schools. There's gonna be a lot of heartache and we don't see it now, so it's easy to forget about that. But we'll have people in here, because you see it in other districts, when we try to close school, when they try to close schools, it's a tremendous heartache for those communities. I don't think they're gonna be thrilled about, oh great, now we get to go to a different school because they're not all gonna to go to, to Laurelwood. They're gonna be split up. Their communities are split up. It's not gonna be a happy situation. I know that's easy to forget about because we're not facing it right now and they're not sitting here because we haven't made that decision. But I think if you think that's what's gonna happen, we better let those communities know before we make any decisions. And I do appreciate our representative from the Bond Oversight Committee because I am deeply concerned about the bond language that suggests we don't have the authority to build a new school for Laurelwood. Um, the language says that we need to renovate the Laurelwood campus. So I think we need to really proceed with caution. Um, okay. Um, Trustee Gonzalez and then Trustee Fair. Trustee Gonzalez and then Trustee Fairchild. I guess I would say that we spent two hours talking about, you know, Briarwood, Bracker, and and uh, Westwood, talking about possibly adjusting the time frame, seeing the data that we got, and looking at what what, what how we can better make those uh, those investments in those schools. We have new da new data as far as the enrollment projections. It's not just birth rates. I mean, you can look at the state. I I, I could tell you. I mean, as far as the uh, there, there are districts that are growing. They're more in the Central Valley, lower cost of living. We, we've seen, you know, for a few years now, K through third grade has been decreasing. Those parents are, are the, the younger parents making less money. I, I don't, I couldn't possibly foresee voting for an 800 person, 800 person school if we're not going to fill it. Obviously, we know that we're going to have difficult decisions. Either 650 or 800, we might have difficult decisions with some of the sizes of our schools that we have. And um, I think that. You know, this is a difficult decision as well for us, but I, I think we have to look at the at the numbers and look at the data and see what 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 it is that it, the projections are. I, I don't see that that we're going to fill it at 800 person school. Can we find needs for it? Can we do different things? We possibly yeah, we possibly can. Maybe it can be our special ed student school. Maybe we can have our um our buddy systems from New Valley will be at the old Laurel Woods campus. We, we can do different things, but we just got to realize that I, I don't foresee us that a natural organic neighborhood population of 800 students. So I'm, I'm more in line with scenario one. I like scenario two before the numbers came out, but I, I can't, I can't uh, vote for scenario two or three. Go ahead, and then I have a question. Thanks, President Muirhead. One of the things I wanted to clarify is we are talking about a school on the Patrick Henry campus. And the, the bond language does say that to rebuild the Patrick Henry campus. Now we can we can change, decide which students go to the Patrick Henry campus. Currently, prior to um, this, this um, it's now been taken back by the district, but it had a private school and a church and a various on our on our campus in the DRC. So we are maybe using language loosely, um, but the intent is we are rebuilding the Patrick Henry School, which is in the bond language, and we can in and for um, a population now. Th this is really hard and it I can understand why it feels like we're pitting against people against each other. I don't like that feeling at all either. I also know that um, we have made lots of promises to our Laurelwood community over the years that we have not kept. I want to build a school. The question is the size what size. And if we can build a school that right now meets the capacity needs and allows us to then um, use money 
for other facilities like the life skills program at Santa Clara High. Um, no, I'm just, sorry, that's my pet project right now. Um, I, I, I want us to be thoughtful about that. Um, a new school is a gift. It's an amazing gift. Um, sometimes we focus too much on, I, I, I feel like there is a possibility it could need to be bigger. There is that, I'm not denying that, but it's still a new school that whether it be 650 or 800, it is a new school that you will be getting. Okay, um, I had a question and I don't know if you're gonna know the answer to this, but um, there is um, some area that uh, the development that's at the corner of Lawrence and El Camino, the new Mio, I think it's called, mm -hmm. and it, which is actually um, sends their kids to Pomeroy, not to Laurelwood. Do you know how many kids come out of that section uh, in there that goes to Pomeroy? We currently have uh, four students. You knew that off the top of your head. I'm impressed. Okay, it's, it's only four students. Is it is it fully developed? Um, I believe it is. I don't think it's 100% rented, um, but we've been. I track it every all the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just uh, four students this year. Okay, there there they must be small units. That's just... There are um, a variety of students there, um, or a variety of apartments, um, studios, one bedrooms, and some two bedrooms. Um, what we do find is that the newer the complexes, the less students, and then once they get around that 10 year range, they start to have more students in them because. Yeah. I'm just wondering if um, if we build up to the 800, if we might want to reboundary that into the new school, since there'd be plenty of room for them and then they wouldn't have to cross Lawrence. Is it more than just that one complex? I remember we made that decision. But no, it's one? just that one complex. That one complex. Yeah. We're trying to balance out the numbers going to Pomeroy since when Central Park opened, yeah. um, it split Pomeroy in half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. I Trustee Canova, you have a question? I have a question to, to our board president. So I believe I heard two board members, uh, Trustee Ratter and, the, Ratter and myself, favor option three. I believe I heard two board members favor option one. I'm not sure what Vicki favored. I'm not sure where you were. And, um, and, I, and I think you're trying to get direction so. Yeah, I actually am seeing more. I'm seeing, um, I think, more than two, but maybe not four. But I, I'd I'm have, getting I would close. appreciate it that the board members could just make a choice of some kind so we can move along here. Don't you make a motion and you'll figure it out? Yeah. Call the question. Go ahead. But I don't know if everybody's had a chance to speak that wanted to. Well, if they have, that's great. Then make a motion and go. Anyone else want to speak? Make a motion. He's going to take the motion from you. Motion for option one, scenario one. Oh. Second. Okay. I am. Okay. Option one. Um. Hmm. Okay. So we have um, option one with a motion by Trustee Gonzalez, second by Trustee Ryan. Is there um, discussion on that motion? Rodman. It's how much trouble I get in. You know, um, there it's is an option trouble. that we haven't rediscussed. So what happened is we had a scenario, we had a committee, committee made a recommendation instead of building two schools to build one large school. Now we've gone back and, and that large school at that time, that recommendation was for 800 or so, 850, I don't remember the exact number, it was more than 800. Now what's happened is we're coming back and looking at it again, and we're effectively changing the decision that was made previously by that committee. So we're revisiting that subject. To me, the solution to this has always been to have two schools, two small neighborhood schools. Um, I think the decision initially in that larger committee uh, was driven by some short-term issues not long-term issues. So if it were me, I would rather just not take this vote at all and go ahead and look at the third option. I realize that this probably will get me hung in effigy, but um, 
it seems like the best solution down the road. I mean, it'll give a brand new school. It'll have, a, it will be able to upgrade the, the Laurelwood, which has always been an excellent school um, and, and come up with a really good scenario. At any rate, that would be my first preference. I'm tempted to actually abstain from the vote. Thanks. I'm, I'm gonna comment first. I, I respectfully disagree. We've made a decision to do one school, whether it was 800 or 600, they, the community wanted the community together, one school. So I, I would disagree with that, but I'm just one person. Um, Trustee Fairchild. I think um, you create a problem when you build a shiny new school, a half a block from an old school. Um, I think it, if that was the, if we were going to be two schools, we should have just reconfigured both. Um, and so I, I just see that right now at, and throwing, uh, if, I feel like I've had whiplash a lot lately and from decisions. <laughs> and so that to me, I'm like, whoa, I can't, I can barely even figure out this one, uh, the two. So I, I, to go down that rabbit hole right now, I just can't, I just can't do, I just can't. And, and that's actually why in the past I, I've said go to the 800, but it's not what I really want to do. Thanks. Well, I'll say, I'll say I served on that committee and I went in with it with the idea that that's what I would have preferred was two separate schools, but the committee through its deliberations settled on one. So, um, and I came to to agree with their decision after all the, the meetings and the deliberations. So I think I, I would agree with Trustee Muirhead that the decision is kind of on. It's been it's been made. Um, okay, so we have a motion um, to go with option one. There were several people um, who were leaning for a different option. So can we take a vote on option one? Are we ready for a vote? Has everyone spoken who wants to spoke? For the vote. Yeah. I favor option three. Uh, I believe that should be the decision we're making. And because would, this motion is for option one and not option three, my vote will be no. I am uh, in agreement with Trustee Canova. Okay, then it might be a quick vote. We'll just have to see. Yes. Well, I think in line with uh, what Trustee uh, Raderman mentioned, we're building capacity in this area, right? We're not using Patrick Henry right now. We're not gonna use it in the future and- Patrick Henry or Laura? I'm talking about Patrick Henry. So if we're building, building a new campus at Patrick Henry. We'll have two schools in that area in, in case in the future, if there are, are issues with uh, size or anything else, we can we can do different things. This, this allows us to, I don't know, maybe one of them could be a K-8 school and the other one can maintain the same boundaries. So uh, th there's just the different things that we're gonna be doing here. It, 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 I know this is a difficult decision for, for some of us, most of us, but it, it is a decision that many districts would like to have the, the plan to be able to build a new school. Yeah. So it, it's an opportunity for us to look towards the future, to hopefully keep the community together as they wanted to and not, not be split up in two schools. But um, I think this is a, it, it's, it's a decision that other boards would, would envy to make. So can, can I ask for a clarification? You're suggesting, um, option one, because if we needed more capacity, you would just remodel the current Laurelwood. Is that what you're suggesting? You, you, we, you walk a lot of, a lot of schools, right? We, we can walk a lot of, a lot of schools, and we, we know that there's portables at other schools. I'm not saying that we build this so we can build three portables or something on the back of it. That's not what I would envision doing. But if the case where we needed some other room, we could either build another permanent structure or we could have portables. And I understand that's not the best way to, to look at building. We can walk through our other 27 schools and see how many portables exist. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. And so the other question that has been begged since we made the first decision that hasn't been answered, maybe it's a better way to phrase that. What happens to Laurelwood? And if you think this has been contained. The existing Laurelwood you're talking about? Existing Laurelwood. So we build a brand new school. We close Laurelwood. We won't, we'll be under enormous pressure to do something with Laurelwood, whether we rent it out as a, another school to a private, private one, like, like what happened with Rainer Park or to, to Stratford or somebody, or whether we tear it down and do something different. But anyway, there'll be enormous pressure to do something with that facility. 
And my suspicion is that's going to be a much more contentious conversation than this one. This one has not exactly made me feel comfortable. So just, <laughs> just being candid. Okay. But I think we need to take the vote. Let's, let's get yeah, on with this. I, I'm about ready. I, I think I'm ready to call the question. So, so let's, so the motion on the floor from um, Trustee Gonzalez, seconded by Trustee Ryan is for option one. So um, all those in favor, uh, please say aye and give me a thumbs up so I can see. Aye. Okay, so I see two. And all those opposed? Um, and are you opening them? I, 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 I'm still thinking, so, but it didn't pass. I, I, yeah, I need, you. okay. So, well, yeah. it hasn't passed, so you can abstain. I'll abstain. Okay. I, okay, let me just. I feel like I voted on this a bunch of times and it keeps coming back. <laughs> Okay, so um, so that motion fails two to four with one abstaining. So I'll take another motion so we can um, do something different. I'd like to make a motion for option three. Second. Three. So we have a motion for option three made by Trustee Canova, seconded by Trustee Lieberman. Comments or should we just go ahead and vote? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. And give me a thumbs up so I can see one, two, three, four. I'm abstaining from the vote because I have to take a stand. You are not taking a stand. Okay. And those opposed? Opposed. Okay. So the same two. Okay. So, and you're abstaining? I, I'm abstaining. I am, I'm sorry. I just felt like I, I wanted, there was too much new information that was thrown out to this, this meeting. Then, and I said, I, I just feel like I've had whiplash these last few weeks and I would, I wanted it to be clearer for me. And I apologize. Um, but uh, I did not feel like I could make a decision tonight. Okay, we need to move on. So uh, you have your direction, option three. Um, and um, I'm sure we will see more coming back to us um, with, with pictures, pretty pictures of what that option might look like. Okay, um, do we, just one sec, do, do we have a timeline for, no, I'm not even gonna ask, Never mind. No. Um, okay, so it, um, is 810. Um, so the next thing would be public comment on our closed session items and then going to closed session. Um, I had someone ask for a break. I don't have very many slips. Are there are, are there very many people who want to speak who did not turn in a slip? Because if we, we could just, just four. Yeah, we only have a few slips. But so people can line up. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna go through this and then you, you can always step away. Um, okay, we're, so we are now moving on um, to the public comment for closed session. Uh, we can only take public comment on these closed session items. Um, the, the three items are D.1, public employee appointment of the principal at Laurelwood Elementary. D.2, um, conference with legal counsel, two items of significant exposure to litigation. And item D.3, employee discipline dismissal release. So I have some slips. We'll start with these. Teddy Duffy, are you still in the room? No, she's not here. Uh, uh, so then it would be Ryan Mizuko, Deja, a DP man, I think it is. Okay. And Lizzie Smith. You can go ahead and line up um, at the podium. And you might want to say which one you're speaking on. Okay. All right, I'm speaking on D.2. I'm here in support of my colleagues in the community who received uh, the investigation letter. My name is Ryan Mizuko. I'm a teacher at Laurelwood Elementary School. Speak really close to the mic. Oh, my apologies. Okay, thank you. So good evening. Uh, first, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the board members. Thank you for your time, your sacrifice, your dedication to students, for your upstanding integrity, and your courage to ask the difficult questions. Thank you for holding our district to a high standard and for being role models of upstanders. Thank you very much. Ultimately, the best decisions will be made when thinking about what is best for students, because that is why we are all here, or more specifically, that is why we should all be here. Currently, I'm very dismayed and lack confidence in our current superintendent. 
At the Laura Wood staff meeting she attended, she asked us if we played video games and then compared our situation to the Oculus Quest virtual reality headset. It was told that it was as simple as hitting a reset button like a video game and then demonstrating such reset. Our lives, our profession as educators, our immense dedication and passion for students, everything we do, everything we give is not virtual reality or some game to us. Making such a comparison showed a lack, complete lack of understanding, compassion, or knowledge of the teachers here at Santa Clara Unified. It mocks and belittles us. In that same meeting, I asked for some form of documentation of our hiring process, something that would be written down for us to see from HR. I was told that I don't know if we have that. I asked again for something to physically see that explained our hiring process, and I was laughed at. Two problems here. One, why would our district not have documents for our hiring practices? And why would the superintendent feign incompetence when asked for such? And two, any reaction would have been better than laughing at us. Um, I believe the questions could not be answered because there is no document, uh, excuse me, not because there is no documentation, but because those hiring practices were indeed not followed. Thank you for your time. Good evening, board members, uh, Dr. Kemp and President Moorhead. Moorhead, um, I'm reading a letter from the teachers at Don College on School, and we're talking about item two. There has been a lack of communication and transparency from the district office under the leadership of Dr. Stella Kemp. For example, at our staff meeting on April 6th, it was stated that Iqbal Chada would return as principal for the 22-23 academic year. The following day, we received a letter of resignation from Mr. Chada and heard from the April 7th board meeting that he was approved to serve as vice principal at another site within our school district. This is exactly what we are talking about when we say we are frustrated with the lack of communication and transparency from the district. Since the departure of our principal, we have asked HR for support and help. But instead of working in collaboration with staff, they made unilateral decisions regarding admin that made a stressful year even more chaotic. As a staff, we were all on board to kick off the year by implementing our K-8 plan, but the inconsistencies with administrators made it an uphill battle. We started the year with Mr. Chata upon his leave. We were, um, Catherine Graham was appointed as a support to our vice principals. Then both vice principals were appointed co-principals. Shortly after our co-principals came into their position, the community at large received the sudden and unexpected news of a new interim principal and the, pro that, and the day before he officially started. This raised a number of questions about our interim principal and the process that went behind the decision. We reached out to the district office with several questions that went unanswered. As a school site, we have felt neglected by the district for years. But this year we felt that neglect was magnified. Instead of working in a partnership with the school sites, which is the Santa Clara way, decisions were made by Stella and her cabinet without any stakeholder input. Moving forward, we would like the board to consider the direction of the current district administration. Let's get back to the Santa Clara way where we work in partnership for the good of the students. Thank you, Tanisha Borgstadt, Shannon Connolly, Noel Diep, John Young, Hannah Johnson, Jennifer Contage, Melissa Lee, BP Mon, Ashley Martinez, Meredith Tanaka, Brian Williams, Brianna Zaporta, Joelle Lee, Helen May Spencer, Jen Kelly, Janice Rossotto, and Christine Azaporti. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy Smith. Good evening again. I wanted to start by doing the same thing as Ms. Mazuka. I want to thank the board members for having the courage to ask the hard questions and keeping the district accountable. I do not know about you, but since the last board meeting, I have heard many similar stories to mine that just didn't go quite as far as being threatened with legal action. The tactical and strategic maneuvering, threatening and harassing behavior from the district cannot be tolerated on any level. Sadly, I've also heard so many that have experienced wrongdoing but are too fearful of retaliation to speak out and draw attention to their communities. Listening to stories of communities trying to be on their best behavior and not emailing the board after being threatened breaks my heart. This is not the Santa Clara way. 
Board of Trustees, I urge you to take a good look at the entire hiring process. For our Laurel Ward community, it's not an issue because the choice for our principal is very obvious. But now in retrospect, I'm concerned that the HR and administration is manipulating the candidates put forth in the first round to further their agenda and reach an appointment that has already been predetermined. Just like the meaningless surveys, I now fear that many of the appointments made under the current administration have been wrongly manipulated. We need to establish trust and caring as core values of our administration. As you know, this is Teacher Appreciation Week. Across the district, communities are working together to make faculty and staff in our campuses know how much we love and appreciate them. While I'm leading this committee at Laurel Wood, my mission is larger. I'm here to fight for all the teachers in the district. They deserve to work for a district that puts their needs and the students first. They do not deserve to live in fear that doing the right thing will cause retaliation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who wishes to speak on a closed session item? Okay, then we're going to go out. We're, we're going to call the public comment in the room closed. We're going to go out to the um, webinar and um, and see if there's comments there. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, President Muirhead. We do have people waiting to speak. Our first commenter will be C D. To our esteemed SUSD board members, I am a teacher in the district and I'm calling to speak on item D number two. Dr. Kemp's behavior as superintendent over the past few years has created a major problem for me as an SUSD educator. How am I supposed to hold my students and myself accountable to the values of student and port adult portraits in Vision 2035 if our top administrator cannot do so herself? I don't see how a leader that wants to exemplify community stewardship would use public funds to threaten legal action against members of the Laurelwood school community. I don't understand how a leader who is supposedly an empowering collaborator would make certain roles obsolete only to then reinstate those roles and hire her associates, such as eliminating Kevin Keegan's position only to purportedly bring it back going by another name next year. The word that comes to mind is nepotism. I find it interesting that a leader who is an equity advocate and inclusivity champion is running a district that has to be held accountable for multiple violations of state English language learner requirements, a continual stalling on special education supports and protective MOUs for teachers and staff, and the general lack of tact when speaking on issues of social justice. Additionally, I find it confusing that a leader who is supposedly an effective communicator would need to continually apologize, backtrack, clarify, and defend her communications over and over again. Not only that, but school board meeting recordings seem to be constantly deleted from YouTube, eliminating and censoring our ability to hold her accountable. At an SUSD school climate and culture committee meeting last month, we were told that school climate references those relationships amongst administrators, teachers, parents, and students, and that school culture refers to the ways teachers, students, and other staff members work together, and the set beliefs, values, and assumptions they share. As a district employee, I've seen relationships decline under Dr. Kemp's influence, festering a climate of mistrust, tension, finger pointing, and disenfranchisement between employees, administrators, and community members. How can students learn effectively when their trusted adults not only feel disempowered, but fear retaliation? I have witnessed the district culture maintained through micromanagement and intentionally structured top-down decision-making, not to mention an alarming lack of transparency, an embarrassing absence of foresight, and an incredible amount of lip service. I assure you that if you decide to keep Dr. Kemp in her position as superintendent, complaints like mine will Please. only continue. They will be brought to your attention because they, until you hold her accountable. Thank you for your comment. If you would like to finish your comment. Thank you. Our next, next commenter, commenter is, is T. Duffy. Duffy. You should see the prompt to unmute. Good evening, board members and Stella. Have you had enough? I have just spoken with you not four nights ago, and I've been pondering this letter. 
And I've been, I'm concerned. I'm concerned of the possibility of lawsuits by a letter that was written. You know, um, my, my questioning, you know, as I pondered over this in the weekend is, did the district, did Stella get um, the okay from the board, get a directive from the board to have this letter written? Or did she just do it by herself? I'm concerned that how many other actions is she doing by herself? This letter is leaving the district open to possible several lawsuits or at least settlements for a lot of people. I'm concerned that this expense, did the board members approve of this expense? How many other expenses are happening that the board members aren't approved, don't get to approve of? I'm just concerned. You continue to hear a litany of situations where Stella doesn't have any respect for the people in our school district or the culture or even understand. As a matter of fact, she has no vision. It's quite, it, you can see that. And how you can see that is she was lucky that this was leaked. Why? Because she had no vision of what would have happened had it not been leaked. She couldn't even see it because she was only worried about somebody getting what she wanted. No vision on what the community wanted. So again, as I will continually ask you at every board meeting, have you had enough? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Ada. Ida. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. Yes, it's Ida. Good evening, board members. I first want to thank each and every one of you for asking all the hard questions. That is holding all of us accountable because not only is staff watching, but our students are watching. Um, even my, my kids keep asking what is going on? You know, how is Ms. Lizzie doing? How are you know, people at Lowerwood? Because they are concerned. And I just wanna read off a quote from today, um, Fremont Union High School District just announced that they're getting a new superintendent. And this quote, you know, that they said really resonated on how things should be done in Santa Clara. And um, it says, the feedback we received has guided our interview and selection process and has been used to craft a set of priorities or areas of emphasis for our work going forward. So the Fremont Union High School District actually listened to the community to set their priorities. They did not set their priorities and then supposedly ask the community. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. We can look at other districts, especially Fremont Union Unified um, High School District in which their superintendent that is now retiring is very well loved in the community. So thank you again to the board members as we continue on to keep asking all the hard questions. Good evening. Your comment, and that was the last hand raised. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate I appreciate all the people. I'm sorry, can you fix the audio? Thank you. Okay, I appreciate all of the comments from our members of the public on this. So we, um, the board is now going into- I have a comment actually, um, a request for an agendized item, an agenda item. Okay. So since the last meeting, I've heard from many, many district employees about the fear and intimidation they have experienced from board members and that they do not feel comfortable and safe coming to the board and speaking publicly. People in tears calling and talking. So I am requesting that we agendize an immediate 360 evaluation of the board. We need a way for employees who have to deal with the board members on a regular basis to share their concerns with an independent third party where they can speak without fear of retaliation from the board or from other employees based on the content of their speech, and that the board can get this feedback and make uh, decisions accordingly 
about the board and policing ourselves. So that's a requ agenda item request that I have. And I wanted to make sure I made that publicly because I have said this before. Um, I know employees have been bullied and attacked um, when they have said things that, that certain board members disagree with. And we have to stop that. We have to protect employees who come before this board to make presentations or to speak their mind, to speak freely. It cannot happen. And the board has to police itself. I've been on this board long enough. We've had situations where we've had to do that. And we are at that point again. So I'm asking for immediately to launch a 360 evaluation of the board conducted by an independent third party, not chosen by any board member. I don't know how we're gonna pick it, but we can't hand pick the people who are going to evaluate us, but we need to do this. Um, okay, so you're asking for a 360 evaluation. So I'd like to get board input um, on moving this forward. Last week, um, you know, Andy made his agenda item requests. That's what I'm asking for. I don't know that we, this is not agendized to discuss. I'm making an agenda item request. Agenda item requests don't require agenda items to talk to us. Brown exempt. So personally, I have absolutely zero problem with the 360 evaluation of the board. I do have a concern about the cost of it, but other than that, um, yeah, no issue. Any other comments about her request? I, I, I mean, I think we, it should definitely go on the agenda. It's interesting, we all talk to different people um, some people complain about some board members and some people complain about others. And it is a, definitely, I, I appreciate all the comments um, that I've received. Um, at, much like what was given tonight, thanking the board for being, having the courage to ask the questions um, that the community wants to make sure that we are getting accurate information. Okay, I think since it's, it's not on the agenda and we might wanna think about this a little bit, then um, I will, um, work to put it on a future agenda so that we can have a discussion about whether we want to do this and how we might do it. Um, because I'm not, uh, I'm not feeling consensus on this. And, um, and so I want to talk it through, but we still have a lot of things we can't. Yeah. I don't think we're going to make a decision tonight. There's a lot of details to it. So it's been noted. And so it'll be um, on the next agenda then as an agenda item request, and we can vote on it then. Well, I'll have to check with the superintendent because the next agenda has already been set. So we'll have to look at that. I think she's asking if it will be under the agenda item request section. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the thumbs up at the end. There's the no thumbs up. Not to do that. Let's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and yeah, I expect to get attacked for requesting. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it because we have deadlines for these things, but um, but we can put it on the thumbs up section. So, um, Superintendent Kemp, you have that. You have that noted. Okay. Um, okay, so we are now going into closed session. Um, at um, During closed session, we'll be talking about D.1, uh, public employee appointment principal at Laurelwood Elementary. D.2, conference with legal counsel, two items of significant exposure to litigation, including one item relating to a complaint filed on April 28th, 2022 concerning the superintendent, and item D.3, public employee discipline dismissal release. When we come back, I just want to do, um, make a note that when we come back from closed session, um, we'll, we'll have readout on closed session, and then we will have an action item just for the appointment of the principal at Laurelwood Elementary. So that's going to happen after closed session. I can, I am not sure when that is going to happen, but um, the live stream will stay on throughout until we come back. If you um, don't want to stay here, that will still be available. Okay, so we are now off to closed session. Thank you all.
put computer audio. Got it. Reclaim stakeholders. So I think that's what what's her name would have been was doing. Well, I think when it was co-host, yeah, because yeah. it kept coming up. Yeah. So now that this is okay. Gotcha. So, all right, I gotta.
Okay, we're live. Okay, thank you. So we are resuming. Uh, we are back from closed session, resuming our open session. So um, reporting from closed session, item D.1, the board received information and discussed. Item D.2, the board discussed the item and are publicly announcing that we are terminating the investigation involving Laurelwood initiated by Haight, Brown, and Bonesteel. And, and we are giving direction. We are resuming. Sorry. Am I doing that? We're back from closed session, resuming our open session. So, um, starting from closed oh. session, can we turn that off? Thank you. Um, I'm going to start over on that. Okay. The board discussed the item D.2. The board discussed the item and are publicly announcing that we are terminating the investigation involving Laurelwood initiated by Haight, Brown, and Bonesteel. And we gave direction to the board president to work with county council to hire an investigator to look into the complaint from 428-22 as required by board policy. And for item D.3, the board discussed. We're now moving on to item F, the ratification of the appointment of principal at Laurelwood Elementary School. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Rotterman. Okay, and uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Good evening. Um, it is my pleasure to announce the principal of Laurelwood Elementary, Paul Fuller. Paul is a product of SEUS USD. Paul graduated from Santa Clara High School he then attended San Jose State University where he received his Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics as well as his master's degree. Paul was hired on August 22, 2007 as a math teacher at Santa Clara High School where he taught algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. During his time at Santa Clara High School, he was involved in several leadership roles and coached football as well as track and field. Paul was hired as a math teacher and special assignment in August of 2013. In his role as a math TOSA, he worked with teachers and instructional strategies. He was a part of the district professional staff development, coordinator of multiple uh, matrix placement. Um, he trained secondary math teachers and proctoring the state exam and piloted an intervention program at Santa Clara High School. In 2013, and also the summer of 2014, he coordinated uh, the summer program with Silicon Valley Education Foundation where he was a math coach and coordinated the Stepping Up to Algebra program where he facilitated college night and university field trips. And for the last seven years, Paul has been the assistant principal of Laurel Wood Elementary School. Okay, thank you. We have a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Lieberman. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Did you vote on that? Yes, okay, so that passes um, seven to zero. Okay, um, our next meeting is on um, a regular meeting on May 12th. Um, I believe it's gonna start at 5.30. Um, and so we will um, see you then. Do I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved, Rotterman. Okay, we have a... Motion from Trustee Raderman, second from Trustee Gonzalez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? We are adjourned at 1142. Thank you all. Good night.